Okay, so obviously a lot has happened in the, the last week or so. And what is interesting is uh, what's happening in continental Europe with the vaccine rollout and Dutch rioting. Yes, Holland's got a bit a bit frustrated with their uh, curfew that's been in place uh, for the last week. And now uh, while the riots have subsided to a point, there's still disturbances across Holland. And uh, the, the Dutch government is in a very difficult position. Um, it's interesting to note also that the, the vaccine rollout has been delayed across Europe and there are concerns about vaccine supply, partly because of how the EU worded their vaccine agreement in the summer, which stated that the primary production points would actually be in the UK, a country leaving the EU, and the secondary production plants would be in Belgium and Holland. And they have fortunately not been able to meet their requirements of production. So. There's some interesting debates going on between the British government and the, the EU in Brussels about vaccine supply. Um, so that's created some headaches for, for, for European leaders. The Dutch situation is, is, is linked to that. Uh, the Rutte government, which has uh, been in government now for, for, for a while, uh, has had its own scandal to do with the benefits payment system that dates back years, pre-COVID. Uh, that's having a knock-on impact with people being unfairly punished uh, and and having their benefits cut, payments not given, and it unfairly hits single parents and and those of, of of immigrant groups, which has led to the collapse of the Dutch government. Now, Prime Minister Rutte is still technically in charge of holding in a caretaker government, and the Dutch government and the Dutch Parliament put forward a proposal for the curfew that's currently in place uh, before Christmas. Uh, that curfew was shelved. Uh, however, the infection rate kept rising. So at the beginning of, of the week, um, the Dutch government introduced the curfew, uh, which stated from 9pm till 4.30am the following day that uh, you have to be, you know, shelter in place, you have to stay indoors. And uh, the, the, there was a proportion, about 18% of, of Dutch people decided to not agree with that. And a fair proportion of them decided to get a bit rioty. Uh, there, there's also other reasons for the riots to take place as well. It's not just the Dutch curfew. Uh, there's been a long, long-standing issues with certain proportions of the Dutch population not being happy with Dutch government policy. And with the recent scandal that's led to the fall of the Dutch government, there's a, a lot of heated tensions in Holland right now. Now, a lot of European countries, including Holland, uh, a government is formed with a coalition of parties, uh, which leads to problems like this. On the UK side of things, uh, obviously the vaccine rollout is continuing. Uh, we are still technically uh, in a national lockdown. And now as, as, as myself, as a key worker, I can keep going to work. I even have my letter stating I can go to work and travel, uh, but people are flouting uh, lockdown rules. There's been some surveys done saying somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of people are following the lockdown rules in place. But there is a proportion between 10 and 20 percent that are openly flouting on a regular basis which is why this virus is continuing to spread. Also, the UK has now brought in travel bans, except for essential business reasons only. That's come a year too late. Uh, other countries have also brought in travel bans. Again, it's reactionary rather than proactionary. Uh, very few countries have come out of this last 12 months with any kind of glory. I think the, the country that's come out the best is New Zealand. The country that's come out second best is Australia. And Australia's had its own issues domestically with the virus and certain domestic policies attached to that. So the, the Kiwis, the New Zealanders have come out looking the most favourable country and how they've dealt with the pandemic and how they've dealt with, you know, uh, uh, not eradicating the virus in the country, but controlling it and allowing more freedom of, of, of movement of its people. Uh, and then we go across the Atlantic to the US and um, it is now law in the US to wear masks on public transport. So interesting how Biden's going to deal with domestic policy. I was asked a lot of questions uh, on, on the main channel on live streams to do with, with politics. And so I thought I'd do some more live streams on this channel simply because the main channel is for sport. Uh, except where it gets a bit difficult where sport and politics collide. And we are having that debate here in the UK. And we're having that debate in Europe as well. Uh, the French government are digging their heels in when it comes to sporting events. And that involves things like the Six Nations and rugby union and football. And so the French government are getting a little bit difficult, and that may put pressure on rugby union, for example, in this case, uh, to rearrange the Six Nations. It's a thing. Um, 
The vaccine rollout situation, though, will be interesting to see if there are any viewers from Europe who are having issues with that. Uh, we know that pressure is mounting on various countries in Europe. Uh, there's a lot of pressure mounting on the politicians. Uh, people are getting more and more frustrated. And there's a lot of blame being laid at the EU's door in Brussels. Uh, you just have to look at the wording of the agreement. They said the primary locations for manufacture were technically going to be outside the EU. The secondary locations would be inside the EU and they've met with shortages. Uh, they've got staff shortages, production shortfalls, and they can't meet the quotas that they'd signed up to. Uh, AstraZeneca is the biggest company involved, but there are other companies that are developing vaccines uh, and uh, medications in order to combat the virus. So the whole thing is a bureau, bureau, bureaucratic, it's the best way to describe it, mess. Where does this leave us? Well, I have received a letter from my employer saying that I'm not guaranteed to get an automatic vaccine. I'm going to have to organise it myself in time, which is something that I'm happy to do. However, it's frustrating as a key worker, uh, whereas some of my friends who are also key workers have automatically been told you have to get the vaccine to continue work. So. There's a bit of frustration there, and I've got to deal with the union membership and other bits and pieces. But it is interesting that my employer has given us a letter specifying that it's voluntary for us. We don't have to compulsory get it, but the company aren't going to lift a finger, even though they've got a lot of government contracts, which is highly frustrating considering uh, that we are frontline key workers. It's a thing. So that's some of the frustrations. I could read through my letter and what uh, it, it states. But I have been told that I have to be careful with my social media content involving my employer, which is frustrating. Um, the interesting thing, obviously, Biden's obviously had his first week in charge as president, first 10 days. And it is interesting to note what he's going to do on foreign policy, which we discussed in the last live stream. Domestic policy, he's already reversing a lot of Trump's policies with uh, presidential decrees. There's only so many of them he can actually do. But the first major interesting thing is he's now mandating public transport in the US. You have to wear a face covering. That is interesting. Uh, I'm not sure how many Americans are going to like that. Uh, there, there's going to be some resistance, I fear, to that policy. We'll have to see how much resistance there is in the coming days and weeks. Uh, but it is an interesting domestic policy. And America is an interesting case. Now, I don't know enough about domestic US policy to comment on every thing. What I know more about is American foreign policy, which is haphazard at best. And there are certain parts of the world that I think with Biden's administration and uh, his foreign policy uh, pro program, he's going to have to focus on. Uh, the issue with the US embassy in Israel uh, being moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, I think, may flare up again. The issue with North Korea and China, China especially, especially what's happening with China and India uh, and what's happening in Hong Kong. Uh, there's going to be some flashpoints which are going to involve US foreign, US foreign policy and using its allies. Also, looking at the UK's position now with the EU, US policy towards the UK and vice versa is going to be very, very interesting. There's a lot on the plate. Domestically, you've got 50 states in the US uh, and uh, they all have their own various state governors have a certain say in what goes on. So it's going to be interesting how we strike a balance between foreign policy and domestic policy, and how he strikes a good working relationship with the state governors in the US. There are a lot of other issues facing the US domestically. Uh, a lot of issues. Uh, the, the, the scheme last year, the the COVID payment scheme, it wasn't a lot of money given to people. Uh, the economy has taken a massive hit. There are massive closures of, of a variety of industries. And unemployment is a big concern. So getting the economy up and running again safely is going to be a key policy for Biden. Very key. What will also be interesting is how he deals with the refugee crisis from Central America, which obviously Trump said build a wall. Um, and uh, there, that's going to be very interesting how he deals with uh, the rest of the Americas. The border closure between Canada and the US is another debating point, but we know the Trudeau government's got its own issues, being a minority government, having issues with uh, gov the governor general position and a few other scandals that the Trudeau government's had to deal with. But the Canadian border closure is 
actually quite frustrating because there's a lot of trade that crosses that border. And a lot of people work either side of it who live in the other countries. So Biden's got a lot on his plate. So that's going to be very, very interesting. There are issues in Scotland with Nicola Sturgeon and the, the, the Alex Salmon scandal and whether she breached the serial code and broke the law, um, even though there's a growing appetite for another independence referendum because of Boris Johnson's handling of the pandemic. Interesting to note the Labour Party in Scotland is null and void. It's it's a dead weight. But politics in Scotland is interesting. Politics in Northern Ireland. Well, Arlene Foster, who is the devolved leader of Northern Ireland, has said we need to look at uh, the vaccine and the, and the trade barriers that Northern Ireland has with the rest of the UK and the EU. So there's some domestic policies that Boris Johnson has to deal with. Um, obviously, the weather has been quite changeable in the UK. We've had flooding, heavy snow, heavy winds. Uh, we've got more snow forecast today. Um, so vaccine rollouts have been affected with vaccine vaccination centres being closed temporarily because of weather conditions and flooding, snow. So the vaccine rollout has been disrupted over here, but not on the same extent as it has on the continent. There isn't shortages, it's just we've had to close vaccination centres because of, of adverse weather conditions, which is a problem that the UK government needs to solve. But it's interesting, so I'll be interested to see what questions people have. Um, there are, I mean, the way that New Zealand's dealt with, with the, the, the last 12 months has been a model to follow because most of the Kiwi population live in Auckland, Wellington and the other big towns and cities. So it's a very urbanised population. Same with Australia. Now, Australia is dealing with it on a state or territory basis. Um, most of the infection rate was actually in the state of Victoria and in the Melbourne urban area. And they had the similar issues that we did have in the UK with care homes being really badly affected. So the elderly and the vulnerable who were already most at risk have been most of the death toll. Interesting. Australia is sort of semi-open for business. New Zealand is pretty much open for business. The rest of the world isn't. So that's interesting. Um, as, as things stand on the 31st of January, we're 31 days into the new year. And this time last year, we were dealing with the Australian forest fires, the, the onset of the COVID pandemic and various nations' responses to it. Uh, at this point last year, we already had cases in the UK. It's been confirmed that cases were in mainland Europe and the UK well before January the 1st last year. How it's been dealt with and uh, how things have evolved is interesting. So that's something to note. One thing I have been following over the last couple of weeks is um, the west coast of the United States and a lot of earthquakes. And of course, you've got the Cascade Range of Volcanoes. And there's been a lot of earthquakes in the San Andreas Fault area in Southern California. Now, they're not been major earthquakes, not on the scale of the 94 earthquake in California and the 89 earthquake in California, but they are happening nonetheless. And I've been following a few of these, these uh, reading up on the literature and, and following a few other YouTubers that focus uh, on, on geoplate tectonics. Yes, I like geography. I like geology. It's a nerd thing of mine. But South California is predicted to have the big one. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, looking at the state of California, it's split into several tectonic zones. You've got the San Andreas Fault Line and the Associated Fault Lines in the south half of California, which run basically from San Sacramento, San Francisco, all the way down to, to LA and, and the border with Mexico. And then you have the Juan de Fuca Plate, which has a subduction zone called the Cascade subduction zone, ironically, and uh, the Cascade Range that starts in Northern California all the way up to British Columbia and Canada. This is a very highly volatile region. Mount St. Helens is in this region. Now, <clears throat> I've watched a few documentaries and, and read up on some literature, and I have friends who live in the LA metropolitan area. And I have friends and family who spend a lot of time in, in California as well. What will happen is going to be catastrophic. Um, building regulations are in place uh, to have buildings at a safe standard of building standard to survive earthquakes. But the whole West Coast is, is different on their building rigs. If you go to like somewhere like Oregon, they were only updated in 1994. Same with Washington State. So any building pre-94, if there's a major earthquake or eruption, they're going to fall down. It's pretty much what, what's going to happen there. Um, Southern California and California in general, their building regulations are much stricter. They were brought in much sooner. 
but there are still enough old buildings, uh, especially in San Francisco, that are at risk of uh, collapse under a, a, a severe earthquake. So it's interesting noting that there's a lot of tectonic plate activity. I mean, the last 24 hours, I was on the phone to my friend last night, and we are watching this live stream. And in the time I was on the phone, there was about nine earthquakes of Richter scale one to Richter scale three in Southern California in a two hour period. There was one every 20 minutes. It was ridiculous. But not enough to really feel any emotion. Uh, earthquakes that size, you would barely feel them. You would barely know an earthquake has taken place. However, they were increasing in intensity and number, which is highly interesting. They're clustering. Now, what experts believe uh, is that at some point between this exact moment and the next 25, 30 years, there will be a massive earthquake in the southern half of California, most likely in the LA urban area. That's going to be very, very interesting when that hits and how the US government will respond to such a, such a disaster. Look at how they responded to Hurricane Katrina in 2005. That was the earthquake that really cost George Bush a lot of popularity, which weakened his position for his second term. The response to Hurricane Katrina was hopeless. Similar to Superstorm Sandy with Obama, that has actually affected the following election. Uh, so disaster relief is a major, major issue. And unfortunately, Donald Trump's administration, a lot of the last disaster relief agencies have had their budgets cut. Interesting. Earthquakes and, and volcanic activity definitely affect the West Coast. A highly populated region, and uh, it will have catastrophic consequences, not just on the people who live in that region, but also on the wider US and global economy. So that's something to note. What is interesting is 80% of the world's volcanoes and earthquakes happen on the Pacific Ring of Fire. This stretches from Antarctica all the way around the Pacific, Japan, the Philippines, parts of Russia, Alaska, Canada, the US, down into Central and South America, through Chile, and back down to Antarctica. It also includes New Zealand and some Pacific Islands. It's a very volatile tectonic region. Most um, of the earthquakes happen on one side or the other. So on the western side right now, it's surprisingly quiet, which means on the east side, which is the west coast of the US and Canada, it's becoming very, very active. And that is concerning because there's a lot of people who live in California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia. There's some really big cities and the building rates may not be up to, up to standard. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. It's something that I'm following in the background. At any point, the big one could happen. And uh, with the amount of earthquakes, minor earthquakes, that I saw yesterday in a, in a four-hour period, it made me scratch my head. And a lot of them were clustered around between LA and San Diego and uh, just around the Bay Area between Sacramento and San Francisco. So it was very interesting to know what's actually happening there under the ground. But it'll be interesting to see how the, the regional state governments and the US federal government would handle such a disaster. Well, there we go. So any questions so far? Because there's a few things going on. Uh, also, there's riots happening in Russia. There's protests happening in Russia with the uh, imprisoned uh, opposition leader. And there's been calls to sanction um, overseas Russian oligarchs who have made money out of uh, you know, being allied to Putin, that includes Roman Abramovich. And that question got raised in the last live stream. What are my thoughts on Roman Abramovich? He's on a list of, I think, 50 high profile Russian businessmen and women who should have sanctions, put, put, who have, should have had economic pressure put upon them. Uh, Abramovich is an interesting case. Obviously, he owns Chelsea you know, amongst his other business assets, which include a large amount of oil and gas businesses that he uh, bought off the state in the mid-90s when Boris Yeltsin was president. And he's made a lot of money. He's bought a football club uh, and he's one of the wealthiest men in the world. Um, it is interesting to see what will happen if any sanctions are brought against Abramovich and Usmanov, who owns uh, shares in Everton. So there's some really interesting things happening with uh, geopolitics in Europe. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens going forward, especially with Joe Biden. Now, the UK government are also interested in looking at this list of potential oligarchs that they can sanction to put pressure on the Russian government. Sanctions are limited in their scope. Um, they really are. But it'll be interesting to see how Putin reacts to, to the pressure from the West. Very, very interesting. Uh, but I'm open to questions. So get your questions in. I know people are watching this live. So get your questions in and then we'll 
we'll have a little see what people have to ask. Let's get the pop up chat out because for some reason sometimes the chat doesn't always work, which is a massive pain in the ass. Right. Okay. So, get your questions in. I want to see what you have to ask. Obviously, there'll be a live stream later on the sports channel. To do with sports stuff, because there's some interesting sports stories happening as well. But this is primarily focused on um, uh, political and social stuff. So it'd be very interesting to see what people have to ask. Uh, talking about um, political stuff, the Australian government is considering uh, making search engines such as Google uh, pay for their news. And Google is threatening to pull out of Australia, which uh, shows that there's a bit of a battle between the tech giants and governments. Also, we've had the interest in GameStop and the uh, interest in uh, amateurs buying shares and then getting banned from buying shares and the share price and the failing company explode over the last 72 hours and then crash again and then we explode again. So interesting what's happening on the US stock market. Um, hedge funds have lost billions of dollars. And social media sites such as Reddit and, uh, and other forums are coming under pressure um, to regulate because there's clearly been breach of regulation and price fixing. Uh, and what is interesting is what's happening with the GameStop situation. Is, while I understand the frustration of, of people going, well, why can hedge funds make loads of money but average citizens can't? You can. You can if you've got a good broker. But what what is interesting is... There has clearly been manipulation of the market, which is against regulation and code, which has been weakened under Trump's uh, presidency. Let's not doubt that. Um, now, I've seen many adverts for, for these various uh, trading platforms where you or I, average people, you might have a bit of extra cash floating around if you've got some savings, or on a decent wage, can invest a little bit of money and get a return. Like I'm not going to name any names, but there are a couple of websites that are regularly advertised on YouTube. So if you don't have YouTube Premium and you just have regular YouTube and and some unskippable ad comes on, you'll see things like Trading 212. Um, you'll see eToro come up. There's a few of these these, these trading websites that uh, give you a gateway into the stock market. Now, some companies will give their employees shares in their company, so you automatically become a shareholder. You can do with your shares what you wish. Uh, you can buy and sell them and, and other things. But your average bloke, your average woman, your average citizen, most of them don't actually actively get involved in the stock market. However, our pension schemes are linked to the stock market and our company bonuses are also linked to the stock market. So when people are manipulating it, being hedge funds or, or amateur investors who are clubbing together on Reddit and um, stupidly buying a, a large amount of shares, what they what they are doing is admirable when they're taking on the, the hedge fund managers who are, well, playing with people's money. But at the same time, people's pensions are linked to the stock market. So when there's massive, crazy fluctuations of what we've seen in the last week, raises some concerns for other people. There's some unintended consequences that will happen. Now, I'm not a maths, maths whiz kid, I never was, but I do follow the stock market with a close interest. What has interested me is even through my lifetime, on average, the stock price, the stock market keeps going up. We've reached some record highs during austerity, which is a head scratcher considering a lot of people have lost their jobs over the last decade and so or so. And I was having this discussion with my neighbour. Looking back since, I don't know, we'll say 2006, we debate, and I discussed this 2006 on the last live stream on this channel, and the financial crash and what happened. There's still been massive rises on the stock market in the last 12, 13 years. Excluding COVID, there have been some overheating best way to describe it, where the average person is not seeing their average salary go up, but some companies and some share prices have skyrocketed. You look at things like Amazon and Google and um, Apple, for example, uh, they're, they're, to the investor in now, you would need to have a year's wages to buy some shares. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, their shares have become prohibitively expensive. So unless you are a very wealthy person, you can't really invest in Apple or Amazon. It is ridiculous. The thing was, I was too young to buy stock at the time on Apple and Amazon when they first entered the stock market, so therefore I didn't really have an opportunity. But those people in their 40s and 50s might have, and some people could literally retire on the stocks and shares that they purchased. They could sell all their shares and make a lot of money and retire and never have to work again, because some people have got lucky with the stock market. 
hedge funds have become a big thing. And on the main channel, on my sports channel, a company called a hedge fund management company called CBC is wanting to buy a lot of shares in sport. And a lot of people aren't happy about this. And for good reason. Um, hedge funds are notoriously volatile, as we've seen in the last week. And CBC have got shares in F1. They want to have further growing shares in, in rugby union, including the Six Nations. And that's where TV rights come in and uh, how we access our favourite sports, because sport is a business. CBC is a sticking point and a bugbear for a lot of sports fans. They have purchased a lot of stocks and shares in listed sports companies. Um, and uh, they're trying to buy a lot of percentages of what we consume sport, be it sports teams, sports competitions, and, and the governing bodies and the companies that are the rest of companies that, that run said things. And uh, there is concern that they're in it just for the money, make a profit and leave. And it won't actually benefit the sport or us, the fans, long term, us, the customer base. So hedge funds getting involved in sport is nothing new. But it's reaching more and more headlines as there's a lot of headlines being produced on sports websites saying that CBC are interested in buying a bigger stake in the Six Nations, a bigger stake in F1, and uh, a bigger stake in the broadcasting companies that broadcast these sports. And so it is an interesting paradigm. Yes, these sports and sports TV broadcasters, they need money, they need funding, they need investment, and that's fine. But uh, where does that investment come from and where does the profits go to? And do the sports actually benefit from said investment or do some very wealthy hedge fund managers make a lot of money and take it out of the sport? So hedge funds are actually a sports topic that we currently have. Now, I'm not an expert on hedge funds. I'm not an expert on the stock market, but I have noticed that the stock market price is much higher now than what it was uh, pre-financial crash. And it is still high, even with COVID. Although many companies have had their share price absolutely annihilated in the last 12 months, other companies such as Amazon have made massive record-breaking profits in the last 12 months and not been out their share of controversy. So the stock market is an interesting topic. I think I might have to do a bit more research to understand uh, some of the issues with the stock market. But the thing that concerns me is when the stock market overheats, we could have another, another massive financial meltdown and stock market crash similar to what we had in 2008 or conversely 1929. That was the biggest stock market crash in real terms which led to a decade of, of political and, and uh, economic instability, which led to global conflict. The only other experience that I could think of where the stock markets had an adverse impact on economies is the Asian financial crisis of the late 90s, which is still being felt today in certain Asian economies, including Japan, which has had two decades of no growth. Japan was once the second biggest economy in the world. It is currently slipped to third behind China. Japan has gone through a period where its central bank has gone on through a period of deflation, which is not good, and the economy has stagnated. Now, the Japanese government obviously spent a lot of money on the Rugby Union World Cup a couple of years ago, and obviously the Tokyo Olympics that's been delayed by a year, which they are very insistent should take place this year because that is a lot of money they put on the line. But yes, the Japanese economy has not been as uh, strong as it was pre-1997 which is a concern because a lot of the big tech companies uh, um, are based in Japan. And uh, we're a very tech-minded global economy these days. What has changed since 1997, just look at your mobile phone. Just look at the internet, the computers that you use. Now, I'm using an HP, but I, at one point, uh, I've, been, I've had Dell PCs, I've had Packard Bell, but a lot of the components are made by Japanese companies. Interesting. It's a very global economy. So it'll be interesting to see what happens on the US stock market with GameStop and Apple and BlackBerry. BlackBerry, I mean, a mobile phone company that's really not good anymore. Nokia. Yes, the aftermath of Nokia is not really a phone company anymore. It doesn't really make these things anymore because it didn't adapt well to the smartphone era. BlackBerry, which used to be a niche phone manufacturer, a mobile phone manufacturer, came up with BlackBerry Messenger, which is a forerunner of things like WhatsApp and uh, Signal and these messaging apps. Now, you have the BlackBerry Messenger network. iPhone had, had their own message network. So BlackBerry were a very, very interesting company. They've hit hard times. Their phone sales plummeted post, I think, 2012, 2013. They didn't really adapt very well to the smartphone. And um, they are still a registered company. They still make stuff, um, but they're very, very, very small 
pinprick now on what they were a decade ago. I remember when BlackBerry was the latest craze. Most of my friends bought a BlackBerry. Normally, it was designed, it was designed and sold to business types. And then suddenly, um, millennials, uh, my age group, decided to, instead of buying phones like this, uh, instead of buying iPhones, they, they went for Blackberries, which were equally as expensive and a massive pain in the arse. I was never a fan of BlackBerry because I could never really use the bloody thing. However, they became very, very popular for a very, very short space of time. And there's a debate whether these these... This, this share price battle in the stock market might hit BlackBerry. BlackBerry has been a, a non-entity for years. It's not been very, very relevant. But suddenly, with with the battle on the stock market that we are seeing right now, it's become a, a relevant conversation again. It's a failing company. It's interesting that these shares that these people want to inflate to beat the hedge funds at their own game because the hedge funds are betting that these shares will drop are in failing companies which is really bizarre because if the share price becomes far too volatile these companies can go bust and it can lead to another financial crisis because there's money tied up in shares and we'll see what happens but regulators are getting involved um, both sides of congress are getting involved republicans and democrats are saying we need to look at the regulation we need to know what's to look what's happening uh, in the stock market and uh, a lot of people have actually lost a lot of money including some of these amateur investors who spiked the share price and then the share price collapsed on GameStop. Now GameStop is a business similar to uh, Game here in the UK. It's a brick and mortar store with an online section but it's not been making a lot of money for a long time. In fact it's a failing business. It's been hemorrhaging money for years. Because of the obsession of uh, the new generation, the younger generations, to go out to online shopping, brick and mortar shops are, are taking a pummeling, absolute pummeling. Um, retail is is not a healthy environment to work in unless you are working in a supermarket uh, or a hardware store because people are doing most of their buying online because of things like Amazon. So it's really, really ironic that they're trying to bump the share price up in a failing company because they purchase all their stuff from Amazon rather than going to GameStop. Now, GameStop's got a bad business model anyway. Even if retail was still a healthy, viable and, and flourishing industry, GameStop's not been a great um, uh, company to, to purchase your goods from for quite some time. Hence why it's making massive losses and making massive redundancies across its business for years. But it is interesting. So we'll have to see what happens on the uh, the share price side of things in the stock market would be very, very interesting to see how it all plays out with regulators and governments getting involved in the free markets. But uh, it's it's a nice it's a nice distraction, I think, from what's been happening with, with the coronavirus pandemic and, and government mismanagement of said pandemic. Um, but now I'm open to questions, so get your questions in. I'll be interested to see what questions you have to ask me, uh, because there's a lot of things going on in the world that are quite debatable and quite interesting and I can give my views on them and go, you know, this is what I think. Um, I'm not a massive fan of how the mainstream media has been reporting things, especially with things like death tolls and infection rates. Why can't they tell us how many people have recovered from the virus uh, and how many people are doing well after the virus, like recovering and health-wise? Why are they going about all these negative stuff? There's a, there's a culture of fear and the media likes playing on that, which is not a good thing, which is why a lot of people are believing in these conspiracy theories. And, and joining the anti-vax movement and joining these protest movements against curfews and lockdown restrictions. And there's a growing distrust of government and the media, which is fueling protests around the world. Obviously, Holland being a flashpoint, but there's been other protests all across Europe and all across uh, Australia, North America and Canada, where civilians are going, we're not quite happy with where we're being led. There's a, a lot of false information out there. And this is where the social media companies such as Facebook and YouTube and Twitter are being given a lot of pressure uh, by governments to stop the false information getting out there. Uh, Reddit as well. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the big tech companies and how they, <clears throat> and the big media, online media outlets, and how they uh, solve the issue of fake news. Yes, that is a thing that we've come to know over the last five years fake news, um, which was formerly known as governmental propaganda yes uh, now that private companies can just splur it out crap and then start censoring people online it's it's a head scratcher social media has had its positives and its negatives and one thing i was discussing last night with my neighbor adam who lives next door was uh how i feel 
that we've gone down a negative road when it comes to socialising with each other. And we can take the pandemic out to a certain point and look at the rise of Facebook and, the, and you could argue some other social media sites such as Bebo and MySpace. Yes, if you're old enough, you can remember them. Yes, I remember Bebo and I remember MySpace. The rise of Twitter. Um, all these social media like Instagram, Snapchat, all these social media apps and websites that popped up in the last decade or so. I can remember a world before they were a thing. I'm actually older than Google, the search engine. I'm older than Amazon, the online retailer. Yes, I actually am 31 years old, which surprises some people with my youthful expression. But trust me, I'm in my early 30s and I'm grumpy. But I have noticed a massive change in how we socialise. I remember when I was at sixth form college, when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, and uh, Facebook started to become a thing. Uh, the only social media I actually actively participated in until 2009 was MSN Messenger. Yes, that's how far back I go. Uh, that is a long time, uh, which was linked to your Hotmail account. Yes, I have one of them. I still do. MSN Messenger was the way I sometimes communicated with my friends uh, after college to organise meeting up, you know, going down the skate park, you know, going down the pub, going to a nice hockey match, chilling out, having a house party. I would message them on that. And then as things progressed, uh, the Facebook and MySpace and Bebo decided to get into the social media war. Obviously, Facebook won that because MySpace is now archived and Bebo has, well, hardly any users. So Facebook became the dominant social media platform that we communicate with. It hasn't all had the, necessarily all the positive Im impacts and, and results that we thought. Um, I think it's increased the issues with mental illness and mental health, uh, body dysmorphia, depression, um, lack of self-confidence. I can see more people struggling now with, with social anxiety and mental health since the rise of social media. A lot of the young people, they live their lives online. When I was in my mid-teenage years, I used to go in the park and have a kick about with my mates. Now it's all sit online and not do a lot, which is a problem. It's a massive problem. Um, I will admit at one point I had a social media addiction about 10 years ago where I was spending far too much time on social media and not enough time in the outdoors. It's a lovely thing called the outdoors. Um, when I was a kid, you know, you had, you know, your mates, you went down the local park, you had a kick about, you went on your bicycle, you cycled around, you saw your mates. Now you're doing it all online. Um, social interaction is done online. And while I am using a social media platform to discuss what we're discussing, the thing is, I don't think we do enough outdoor activity. We don't socialise enough. And I use examples like the sitcom Friends and the sitcom Cheers, where you have that meeting point in the cafe or the bar and you need to hang out with your mates and, you know, do your hangout things, plan your stuff, go on road trips, go on camping trips. And you can't do that anymore. There isn't like a meeting point in town anymore. It's all on, people are always on their mobile phones and they're looking at their social media accounts rather than having a face to face discussion. It's something I've noticed that we're, we're not as social interactively face to face as what we once were. It's the same in business, it's the same in work. I look at the amount of people who are on social media 24 7. It's not good. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, Occasionally, go on social media every now and then. I have a laugh. I avoid politics on social media because that is a toxic, toxic thing. And I just get on with my day life. But some people get really involved in and dive into the world of the internet and don't really come back out, which is a problem. And the social media companies, uh, you know, uh, I've come under increasing pressure with how they deal with with with. Know, mental illness and mental health, suicide, online bullying, um, hate online. They've come under increasing pressure in recent years because there's been a spate of high profile incidents that have a negative connotation. Uh, I look at the, the Logan Paul incident with Suicide Forest, which is actually affected my YouTube channel, which has frustrated me with the way uh, the, 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 the Paul brothers are still making lots of money off the platform. Yet most YouTube users have been punished on the platform for saying a few words. It's a problem. The word influencer doesn't sit comfortably with me. Some of these YouTubers have never actually had a proper job. They don't know what it's like to actually graft their money. They survive on likes and shares and and 
they don't know how the real world actually works. They, they really don't. Now, I have a nine to, well, I have a, 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 a grafting job where I don't make a lot of money. I don't. I really don't. I live by myself in a very small, very tiny apartment, uh, if you're American, or a flat if you're British. I live in a studio flat. It's tiny. My bedroom is my living room. My kitchen's linked to my bath. That is it. I have three rooms in my little flat. It's, it's tiny. It's it's not not ideal, but it's it's what it is. Um, and that's a problem that a lot of people my age face. Um, if this is 20, 30 years ago, the amount of money I'm paying, I could have got a two bed flat with a mate. It's generally the cost of living, which is something else that some of these these uh, Instagrammers and YouTubers who've made a fair bit of money off the platforms uh, don't realise um, that if you work a, a full time job, you can barely afford to scrape a living. Cost of living is a massive problem for the majority of people, and they see social media as an escape. See it as an escape. And these social media companies, even though they're on the stock market, are actually making massive losses, some of them, which is really interesting. Uh, they're not highly profitable. So they started harvesting our data. And there's a debate about how much they're allowed to sell to advertisers. So you'll notice that when you are on YouTube or you're on uh, Instagram or whatever, or TikTok or whatever social media you want to use. I'm not a fan of TikTok, by the way. It's a poor man's YouTube. Lots of stupid things. Happen. You'll see targeted advertising. And it'll be very frustrating. So... I'm a big sports fan. I get a lot of sports adverts. I'm a big video game fan, film fan. I get a lot of film adverts, and that's fine. That's fine. But I get a lot of betting adverts because I watch sport. I'm not a fan of betting and sport being linked so intrins intrinsically. And what I've noticed is since the US has allowed more regulation to allow legalized betting across the US, not all states have legalized it, more betting ads. It's really frustrating. Um, especially when they're unskippable when you're stuck with them. And gambling has been a big issue over the pandemic. Massive issue over the pandemic. So I'd be interested to see what people's views are on, on gambling ads and, and the regulation of, of legal gambling. Um, I've not, I, I play the, the local lotteries here. I buy the old scratch card, but I don't go on fruit machine. I don't go into bookmakers anymore. I don't gamble on sports anymore. Um, and I occasionally buy myself a lottery ticket or two. I haven't won anything. Um, but for the most part, gambling is not really uh, a big part of my life. I'm not a big fan of it. But national, the healthcare lotteries and the national lotteries and things like that, there's a charitable link to them where a lot of money goes to charity from tickets sold. So I'm a bit more, okay, money's being raised for charity and, and lottery grants for, for social projects. I'm happy with that. And it, it's a one-off. But once or twice a week, I buy a lottery ticket. I have, if I win stuff, I don't have to gamble ever again. But... I just use up my spare change. I don't spend a lot of money on lottery tickets. Some weeks I don't buy a single lottery ticket or a scratch card. So I, some weeks I'm not interested. Other weeks I'm like, you know what? I feel like I might need to go. Betting ads is another. And, and the link between gambling companies and sport is now having a political dimension uh, because the, the, the UK government has got, got involved. Similar with alcohol advertising in France, uh, that is banned on sports jerseys. So let's say the... Uh, sports team in the UK is playing a Champions League football. Let's say, let's say uh, Singer Beer, they used to sponsor um, uh, Everton. When Everton were playing a match in France, they would have blank shirts or a secondary sponsor in place of Singer. There you go. Uh, when Liverpool used to be sponsored by Carlsberg, they would play the Champions League or Europa League matches in, in, against the French team. Carlsberg was dropped from their jerseys. The French have got an alcohol ban on sponsorship. It's a thing. The tobacco ban and sponsorship has been in place for about 20 years. Uh, if people remember the days of Damon Hill and, and Mika Hakkinen challenging Michael Schumacher, though all those um, F1 teams were sponsored by Marlboro, Rothmans uh, and West, which were tobacco companies. You don't see that anymore. Uh, you look at the old superbikes in my OGP, Lucky Strike was a major sponsor. Rizzler are a major sponsor of the Suzuki team. You barely see them now. So... Betting could go down the same way. And there is a debate about banning betting sponsorship uh, in, in professional sport in the UK, and that has got political. There is a political um, will and a rising call to wean most sports, apart from horse racing, away from gambling sponsorship. Um, there's been a few high-profile gambling incidents, and there's been links to match-fixing, which again gets into a criminal and political element that 
is not nice. Cricket has, for example, had several match fixing scandals that involve illegal gambling. So that's something to consider. But anyway, I'm open to questions now, so get your questions in before I keep rambling on for another 44 minutes. Because you might have something completely uh, on a different topic that I haven't discussed yet. Because right now it's it's me rambling on about various issues that I think are affecting the world today. So I'll be interested to see what you guys think, feel, and what questions you have. Uh, obviously, uh, if they are political and sport related, I'll answer them. But for the most part, sport stays on the other channel. And we'll get on to the other channel later this evening. But for now, I thought I'll have another little upload on this channel have a discussion about non-sports things. I haven't even gotten to films and DVDs and TV series yet, because there's a few things that are interesting. And there's a few programs that, you know, I still watch, even though they, they stopped airing years ago. I like watching reruns. I'm a massive Miami Vice fan. I have every single series on DVD. They haven't been on the TV since 1989. So that's <laughs> the year one before. And the syndication rerun stopped in 1990. So when they then re-syndicated them on, on British TV in the mid-90s. I grew up watching Mummy Voice because my mum was a fan and I now have all of them on DVD. Video games, the, the Microsoft decision to increase the price of Xbox Live. That hasn't gone down very well. Um, gaming fans are very, very annoyed They're in the middle of a pandemic uh, with shortages of consoles that Xbox uh, have decided to double the price of Xbox Live. Uh, amongst other things. That went down really badly last week. Social media was just a flame with um, indignant, angry gamers. And that could cost Microsoft millions. Yes, well, Microsoft and Sony. Sony make a lot of laptops. They make mobile phones. They make TVs. Microsoft is the publishing platform. It's the software to the hardware. Now, Sony have had their own issues with the PlayStation brand since the PS2. The, PS, the PS3 and PS4, well, they sold more units. They had a lot of issues with the security after the Sony hack about seven years ago. Microsoft, um, their servers are more secure, but they are a bigger company. Yes, Sony make the hardware. Microsoft make the software that goes in the hardware. So they're linked companies anyway, um, which is really interesting because you can get a Sony via laptop where you can play let's say, Halo on it, which is a Microsoft-based game. They are intrinsically linked. It is very interesting. Um, but Microsoft was a better established company that made more money before Sony did. Um, <clears throat> there's a reason why Bill Gates is, like, I think, the third richest man in the world, or the fourth richest man in the world. He made his money in Microsoft. Microsoft has its flaws, and I'm using a Microsoft-based operating system right now, but I'm using an HP laptop. Xbox is interesting with the they raised their price of Xbox Live from 40 to 50 pounds in the UK and now they're raising it again. The US it's gone up to a high $120 and it was 60 before. And gaming fans are going, well, you want to try and sell your new product in the middle of a pandemic, there's an economic downturn, we're not happy with this, and a lot of people switching to PlayStation. Sony are rubbing their hands with glee because the Sony Live is cheaper. But yes, Microsoft uh, for a long time had a massive dominance on the home PC software market with operating systems. At one point, I think 90% of home PCs and laptops had Microsoft as the oper operating system. Although now Linux and iOS have taken a huge chunk away from Microsoft uh, doing uh, it, it. Microsoft has a, had, had a few failures. Uh, Vista was one. The XP format, which went from Windows 93 to Windows 95 to ME to XP, was uh, a family of operating systems that were all linked to each other. Then Vista came along and even bankrupted the company. Windows 7 was all right. I've got Windows 10. Windows 7 was okay. It was better than Vista. My, my other laptop I have is a Vista. My previous Packard Bell was an XP. And my Packard Bell operated far smoother than my Vista. Vista was a, a mess of an operating system. Uh, Windows 7 takes the, the best bits from XP and a few working features from Vista, and it works. Um, it saved Microsoft. It really did. Um, Microsoft had a, a real 
bad product with Vista. They, they went away from a successful format to an unsuccessful one. And what was funny was a lot of companies were told Vista was the new operating system we need to upgrade. And then they very quickly went back to XP because XP had updates for many more years to come. And a lot of companies were still using XP even when Windows 8 was released uh, because they lost faith and the cost, uh, the costs incurred. And because they, it was very difficult to transfer stuff after, over to iOS, a lot of companies stuck with Windows, but on the XP format, hence why they kept the XP updates going until three, four years ago. Um, Microsoft realized their mistake, came out with Windows 7, came out with Windows 8, and came out with Windows 10. Which ironically share a lot of features with the old XP platform. Um, they just improved them and then improved with the updates. Um, but Windows Vista, Windows, Windows Vista was a massive stain on Microsoft's um, uh, success story. Uh, and Bill Gates' success story. Now, Bill Gates has taken a massive step back from Microsoft. Uh, he's no longer the, the boss of it. He has massive shares in the company, but he no longer runs the company. Um, and he's obviously doing his other ventures, including uh, vaccine research and healthcare research. And then there's all those um, conspiracy theories saying he wants to put microchips in us. He doesn't. But Microsoft has had its battles, as long with, along with Google, uh, with the EU. And they've been fined by the EU multiple times, hence why Windows Office is now a paid subscription service and doesn't come free with your PC anymore, which is frustrating for us as the consumer because actually it was quite a useful tool to have and now it's it's not an added cost. There was a reason why people chose Microsoft because there were a lot of features that were free on it, which now you have to pay for. Hence why iOS and Linux have taken more market share away from Microsoft when it comes to home operating systems on your PCs and, and laptops and tablets. Um, and it's a more competitive market now, but some of the other options aren't actually that great either. I'm not a fan of the iOS. Um, I noticed with my tablet it was slowing down, and then I realised the updates were slowing it down, so I stopped using it um, completely, totally. I haven't used Apple for years, and I'm so glad that I've got my HP that I've had for three years and it's still working. Obviously, I will have to upgrade at some point in the next year or so because this laptop, the webcam is crap. I'm not going to lie, the picture quality isn't great. The microphone, and every time I do an update, I have to restart the computer because sometimes the, the, the webcam and the microphone stop working, which is exceptionally frustrating, especially when I have my headsets as well, which actually are a better quality sound. But people complain because it was, it's just it's frustrating. But Microsoft have shot themselves in the foot. The EU have shot themselves in the foot as well with their constant lawsuits, which actually led to people buying into Apple and Linux. But Linux is still a very niche operating system. Apple, you're buying the brand, you're not buying the product. The product is actually not as good as people think it is. And Apple's having its own uh, battles with lawsuits with deliberately slowing down devices, which has pissed off a lot of consumers going, well, my phone worked fine until the last update, and now it doesn't work at all. What is the point? Um, but I was discussing BlackBerry earlier. BlackBerry had a great opportunity with the BBM Messenger. and They didn't adapt well to the smartphone. They misread the, the, the mood of, of the people when it came to buying products because Apple got into the smartphone market. But Apple, you pay twice as much for the same thing you get on Samsung and uh, other smartphone manufacturers. Nokia, for example. The early 2000, the late 90s, early 2000s, Nokia was the biggest mobile phone company in the world. A European success story. It beat the US and Japanese at their own game. They didn't adapt well to the smartphone market either. They were still making basic 2G handsets when the early 3G versions of these were coming out, hence why Nokia is never not going to think. Ericsson had to combine with Sony to make Sony Ericsson, now it's just Sony. Because um, Ericsson also was flawed in there. They bought out the Walkman, they, they Sony Ericsson. Ericsson and Sony merged together. I actually used to like Sony Ericsson phones. They were quite good. They were nearly as good as the old Nokia 3310s. Um, they were just a bit more breakable. Motorola, they're another mobile phone company that's hit hard times that aren't as successful as they once were. But it's a very competitive market. And Apple changed it all with you know their first touch screen, flat screen smartphone with the original iPhone 13, 14 years ago that came out. Um, but it was prohibitively expensive and was limited to certain networks, which actually limited its appeal. But then it built a fan base, but then people realised it's not actually that good. You're buying the product, right? You're buying the, the the label rather than the product, and you know, it's a thing. 
I've got loads of games consoles. My first console was a PS1, which I still have. I have multiple PS2s. I then went to Xbox 360. I now have an Xbox One, which unfortunately I haven't used for a few months because I don't have a lot of space in my flat. I've never really got around to it. I've got to do loads of updates and I really can't be bothered. Uh, I was tempted to get the latest Xbox and PlayStation. However, my economic situation has changed and I can't justify spending nearly a £1,000 on two consoles uh, at the moment. That's been put on hold until prices drop and supply and demand improves. Um, I, I've i still got my, my, my Xbox One. Uh, terabyte um it's it is what it is but i haven't used it for six months i haven't plugged my xbox in since i've lived in this flat and I, I i've gone off gaming to a point i think the way the games companies constantly put the microtransactions in um the, the online side of things has gone down the toilet recent weeks and microsoft are feeling the punishment for that uh Sony have had their own issues with their own online breaches of security of users, so I'm a little bit more... Hmm. Yeah, I mean... Uh, I find the game experience better on an Xbox than a PlayStation with the way that the homepage is laid out and you can access things. But at the same time, I PC gaming, well, you're spending a lot more on a, a device that's very quickly outdated. Um, don't get me wrong, I, I, I haven't gamed on PC for a very, very long time. I used to. A few of my friends actually own gaming PCs, which is kind of fun when they let you play. But at the same time, that's a big, big cost to, to build a gaming PC. And they may have a limited shelf life as well. But my PS1, I still get out every now and then and plug it in. Um, I love my old PS1. Of course, it's very hard to get games these days because they often stop publishing them. Um, a long time ago, but that was an iconic bit of my youth was was PlayStation. My early teenage years was PlayStation, and I moved to Xbox in my early twenties. Now I just don't have the energy to game as uh, as as much, and the condition on eBay is variable because uh, when it says nearly new or used, you've got to hope that when it arrives, it isn't a dinner plate which is scratched to shit. Um, I've enjoyed my my gaming experience, but I don't really game that much anymore. Uh, it's lost a bit of a luster for me. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an overgrown child, don't get me wrong. Uh, I loved Red Dead. I loved GTA V when it first came out. It's now been on three different consoles. That is ridiculous. Um, if and when GTA VI does come out, I probably will purchase a console just, just for that game. But that requires me saving up a lot of money. And I do feel that Rockstar have let it slip with focusing on the GTA 5 online and it's not actually that great a product. Um, I'm still getting adverts with the GTA online on Facebook, on YouTube, popping up. I find it really, really uh, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm in my early 30s now. I still game. I still enjoy console gaming, um, but I have less energy to do it. And at the moment, there's no real good titles out that interest me. What I'm looking forward to is the next Halo, uh, the next uh, Gears of War, and the the next GTA. They're the con they're the titles I'm looking forward to in the coming years. But at the moment, um, a Call of Duty, I've gone I've gone completely off Call of Duty. Uh, I enjoyed it for a period, but Warzone is not fun. I mean, this time last year I was playing uh, Modern Warfare. Didn't enjoy it anywhere near as much as I did with previous titles. And I think it's run its course as a, as a gaming franchise. I think they, they, there's too many issues with it. Um, and yeah. I, I played the original Modern Warfare trilogy. I did enjoy them immensely. I had a lot of fun with them around my mates' houses and stuff like that. Um, but you know, that was a decade ago. Um, the, what is interesting is how much things have changed in the last, I'm going to say, 13 years. And I'm going to hark back to the financial crisis, which I did in the last live stream. There's been a massive change in people's outlook to life. Um, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, back in the day when I was in my teenage years, yeah, you used to have the old games night. You go around your mate's house. You all come over. You bring your controller. <laughs> you know, you had the memory. You had the multi-tap on your PS1 or PS2. You brought your controllers over. 
or you bought your laptops over, you synced them up with the local area network and played some strategy games like Command and Conquer and Total War and things like that. And they were fun. They were fun. Don't get me wrong. They were hilarious. I think we've lost a little bit of that when everyone's online at home now and you're all in different locations and you can't meet up. You can't just have that games night where you go around and you, you bring your consoles over. We used to do that a lot. Yes, that was a thing I used to do back in the day. I used to unplug my PlayStation, PS2, bring it around the mate's house, plug in the multi-tap, have a four-way or eight-way battle on Tekken or something. And we had a lot of fun. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, it's a shame. It is a shame. Um, yeah, I'm in my early 30s now. I think, yeah, I I don't mind gaming. I still enjoy it. But at the moment, there's no... The games I've got, I've, I think I've gone through them now. I've got to a point where I'm a bit bored of what I've got. Um, and there's no current titles that really immerse me. And the cost of it as well is becoming quite prohibitive um, to, to purchase. I will most likely get uh, uh, the, the next gen xbox the next gen ps uh, ps5 when uh, gta 6 comes out and that is rumored to come out next year so fingers crossed that we get a gta 6 there are a few leaks that have come out from rockstar on various game game websites um and games news websites that it is in development and it will probably come out in about 18 months time um i think rockstar though well, we don't know. Uh, from what has been rumoured, uh, it's going to take place in the US and Brazil. So they're looking at uh, expanding it to South America. So they're looking at expanding it outside of North America. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we have a, a, a main protagonist, a female or male, because in the last GTA, you had three playable male protagonists. And if you look at the GTA storyline, which is really interesting, um, from GTA 3 all the way through, there are only two characters that appear all the way through. Neither of them are playable, both are radio presenters. Uh, you've got that crazy Latino love guy, and you have Laszlo. And the real Laszlo, whose character is based upon, is a writer of GTA. He writes all the scripts and all the storylines. Now, Laszlo is a real radio presenter uh, who has his own radio show, a talk show in the US on radio and on podcast. And uh, he obviously made his character like a, a, a meetable character in GTA 5, and it was quite hilarious that. Laszlo is uh, uh, having a midlife crisis and is, you know, a mess. And he's washed up and he's doing real crap TV, which is really funny. The real Laszlo is actually very, very successful and is completely opposite to that. But he basically based his play his non-playable character on a lot of uh, famous celebrities at the time in the Los Angeles area who had hit hard times and had their various legal issues. And if you follow Laszlo's story throughout all the GTAs, it is quite interesting. What is interesting is the GTA universe, there's a lot of characters that keep popping up, which have been playable in the past or uh, have been part of storylines in the past that keep popping up in various iterations. And it is quite interesting. It'll be interesting to see how they, they do it, obviously, with the, the character changing dynamic and, uh, and um, how they did the last storyline, which was quite immersive and actually quite fun. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they do the next set of characters playable and non-playable and if we actually have a female protagonist which i think a lot of people are calling for that they should have a female protagonist as one of the main protagonists in the gta universe which is a playable character we've had non-playable protagonists who are characters in their own right uh, but it'd be interesting to see if in the storyline uh, in the in the, the free well campaign mode so to speak um the fact you have a female protagonist that would be really interesting that's what i'm looking forward to um I would actually really enjoy that because it would be a slight shift uh, in a positive direction that I think the, the, the games franchise could make um, because so far all the playable characters have been male. And I think there's a growing cause to bring a female playable character in. They've done it in Gears of War. Um, they, they've done it in Perfect Dark uh, long before GTA was successful. Perfect Dark and Perfect Dark Zero, done, the playable character is female. Um, they've done it in Resident Evil. I think GTA, the biggest, most well-known games franchise of all time, I think a playable female character, I think, is definitely needed in the main campaign. Um, I think that will probably be a unique selling point uh, they can use. Um, the rumours are that it's going to be still based in the US and, and links to South and Central America, which makes it a little bit more interesting. But having a GTA based in, in a fictional London or a fictional Paris or a fictional Berlin or fictional Milan or something like that, or fictional Naples, would be highly interesting, linking the North American parallel universe, GTA universe, with, with Europe would be really, really interesting as well. But that's a, that's that's something that is discussable. 
But all we know is that a most likely the release date is sometime late in 2022, most likely in the autumn or fall if you're American. So sometime around September, October, November 2022 is when it's likely to be released. There's been a few leaks coming out. There's been discussion on fan forums for quite some time. And uh, the Rockstar developers, they've, there's been interviews given and, and questions by journalists uh, uh, from not only the newspapers, but the TV companies and, and independent games websites. So Journalists have been asking questions about a GTA 6. They say it's going to happen. They're being a bit coy with the setting, playable characters, and, and where it's going to be based. Um, but with GTA 5, the three playable characters and three story arcs, backstories to work through, that all interest, interestingly link with each other. It will be interesting if a character already existing in the GTA universe is playable. Nico Bellic, he does actually appear on Life Invader. Very interesting. Um, there's there's links with um, previous GTAs in GTA 5. It will be interesting to see what happens. Um, it will it will be interesting to see how they how they deal with the release because uh, and development and and where it's set. Um, it's but look at Red Dead. They linked in Red Dead One with Red Dead Two with a backstory and it's a prequel of of, of Red Dead original um, with. So they filled in some of the, the, the character holes from the first one by going back in time a couple of decades before and filling in the backstories of how uh, Marsden got his scar, um, where he gets his hat, um, his son, who ends up being a playable character in the first one. And so it links in very, very well how he gets his farm and it expands upon the first one by going with a backstory with a prequel. We could see a GTA prequel that's set before GTA V. Um, but I find GTA 4 was my favourite because at the time of the financial crash, which when it is set, um, it does resonate more with me because that, at a time when I was a teenager, it did resonate quite quite bad, quite well with me. And I still play it today. I've been playing it on and off since 2009. Uh, I really got into um, GTA 4 uh, at the time and I still play it now. Uh, it's, it's one of those video games that has stuck with me for years and it's still the second best selling GTA after GTA 5. Um, it's still popular, it's still played, people still enjoy playing it. Um, I think its setting is darker and less humorous, whereas GTA 5 has got a bit more humour and a bit more light to it and, and some funny strangers and freaks. But what is interesting to know is some of the strangers and freaks you meet in GTA 4 are also in GTA 5 with the Epsilon program. Yes, there are some good little link overs between the two. So that's some good story arc development by the developers and the writers. And I hope they continue out of GTA 6. Um, I really do. I also hope that non-playable characters that we've met before become playable as well uh, or have another story arc where they continue, such as Lester, for example, in the wheelchair. I hope he does have a story arc continuing because he was a real fun addition um, with, with you know his character. And imagine making a film franchise out of this and the spin-offs you can make. Um, I, I, I think there is the GTA universe is really immersive and you can actually believe it's real world. Um, it's, it's fun. It's interesting. It's, it's a, a piss take on society. Um, it does play on actual real events that are happening. So San Andreas, for example, is, is actually based in the early 90s, not 2004, when it was developed. And... It links into the, the Rampart scandal in the US, which was a massive police scandal in LA. Um, that is, the ramifications are still being felt today with the beating of Rodney King, which is a massive moment in the civil rights movement and police brutality and undercover policing and regulation of the police. It sparked the LA riots, which were really bad. In the build up to the Football World Cup in 1994, there was a backdrop of LA uh, in a bad place. Lethal weapon. Three also has links into the Rampart scandal with corrupt police officers in its storyline. So a social event, a massive event politically and socially in the early 90s has an impact on film and video games that we as people consume today. A decade after the Rampart scandal, they make San Andreas linking back to that period in time. Lethal Weapon 3, I mean, one of my favourite film franchises, also makes reference not to Rampart specifically, but police corruption and um you know dodgy things going on in undercover police units and it's the basis of the story on gta3 because internal affairs gets involved and that's where martin riggs meets you know his his second wife really interesting how that plays out 
And uh, of course, there's there's a, a killing of a young black man in that film, and by a police officer, uh, by by Murtaugh, and it it links in really well with things that were actually happening in the greater Los Angeles area and across the US at the time. So it's an interesting topic. And uh, yeah, I think I've gone a little bit off where we were with with, um, you know, with going to PC gaming, but GTA 6, I don't think it's going to be set in London. Uh, there's been no interest to set a GTA in London since GTA 2. And, and the GTA universe from GTA 3 onwards has basically been set in the US. If I was, you know, uh, on the Rockstar development team, and this is my personal opinion, they, they, they've done little missions in GTA 5 in, in the Midwest uh, based on a, a film called Fargo uh, in North Yankton. That would be really interesting if they were to go to, to small town America and set a GTA like Redneck, Meth, like, like Breaking Bad with, with, with its storyline with Meth production. Going to small, small city, small town America in the Midwest and setting a GTA there. Uh, that in itself, I think, would be brilliant. You can have more open world roaming, and um, the Midwest gets largely largely forgotten in, in video game and, and film media and TV uh, series. It does let you know the, mid, the flyover states, as they're called, get largely forgotten by the big studios, the big game companies, uh, the TV you know, TV shows, sitcoms. It does get largely forgotten. Um, I think the only uh, TV series I can think of that does focus on rural America is Longmire as a crime drama, which was a brilliant crime drama that was on British TV, which is, I think it ran for four series. It's a fictional uh, county in Wyoming, uh, local sheriff, local crimes, um, some pretty bloody storylines. Longmire was a very, very good program, underrated. And um, it would be nice, I think, to see a, a more a GTA possibly focused on more Middle America, which gets largely ignored by the mainstream media and mainstream film companies. I mean, I think Fargo is the only, by the Coen Brothers, is a, is a great crime comedy, black comedy crime caper that, that is set in, I think, Nebraska. Um, but for the most part, those states get largely ignored when it comes to storylines and, uh, uh, and media. That'd be interesting. But here's the thing. It's an interesting thing. It's an interesting topic to think about. Um, I... I think it's worth a look. And you never know. I mean, with GTA 5, there was parts of the San Andreas which were like um, Palito Bay, for example, and then the, and uh, where Trevor Phillips lives in his caravan park that are set in rural America, which is a lot of southern and central California is actually quite rural like that. And the focus on the big city lights is something that TV sitcoms have done for years. It's Big Bang Theory set in Pasadena which is in the LA metropolitan area. Friends set in New York. Will and Grace set in New York. Uh, Frasier set in Seattle. Uh, Cheers set in Boston. You look at some of these big, successful... Uh, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Bel-Air is uh, a very wealthy suburb of, of LA. You look where they're set. They're set in the big city. They're set in the big city lights. Um, there's, you know... Even Bill and Ted, San Dimas, which is a satellite city of LA. It's still set in urban America. If, I think GTA, if they are, do a, a crazy story arc in the next one. Middle America, some of the flyover states, uh, rural America, that'd be kind of fun. Redneck America would be kind of fun. Um, there's a lot of things you could do um, with with that. There's a lot of characters you could drop in. Um, a lot of different type of heists and, and storylines you could drop in with some of the missions where you've got to like Robber a highway, um, you know, a freight yard, you know, meth production, all these things that were touched on in GTA 4 and GTA 5. You're outside the big city and there's a big open world road, much as, much as Red Dead, which made Red Dead really fun. It's like you had lots of wilderness to explore. That would be quite fun, uh, I think. Um, and it's something we sort of saw it in Fallout, um, where the worlds ended and, and the big cities are all wastelands and got to explore and some of it's quite open exploring we, we could see that that could be kind of fun but it's an interesting sub point i mean i don't want to waffle too long about video game production and what i would like to see in gta 6 um but it is definitely worth thought it's definitely worth uh uh thinking about and i think the i think the rockstar are definitely considering um 
considering their options. I mean, uh, from the latest article that I've read, I'm going to go online for this because I'm lazy and I can't remember it. Uh, GTA 6 News. Let's, let's have a look at GTA 6. Okay, because... Uh, Oh, they've already released some, some, uh, Grand Theft Auto Trilogy Remastered could launch for GTA 6, which is GTA 3, Vice City, and San Andreas. Could, that's a rumour. Uh, non-linear. Right. So on the 22nd on, of January, this month, uh, a, cover, a website called Games Radar, which is a, pretty well known for its scoops that it does on video game production. GTA 6 release date news and rumours. GTA 6 uh, they're apparently meant to re release um, some kind of reveal on March 25th about where they're planning to set it. They might going to start doing some of the, the marketing they did for GTA 5 with the various adverts. GTA 6 is practically an eventuality regardless of whether it's been officially announced or not. With the success of GTA Online and previous GTA installments, you know Rockstar already has something planned for the 6th Grand Theft Auto game. Right now, we've only had hunches and the room of mill to rely on, and Rockstar teasing fans with official Rockstar support account. It's nice to stay tuned. So, yeah, it's in development. According to a Kotaku report, a new entry in the Grand Theft Auto series is early development as of April last year. That report also suggested that we can expect to see a smaller launch with the game expanded through updates in the manner of an MMO or GTA Online, which is not what I really want, really. The development timing means expecting the game to be a PS5 and Xbox Series X title is a sure bet, and the release of a remastered GTA 5 for PS5 in 2021 suggests we can wait at least until 2022 for GTA 6. Keep reading for all the tea on the rumours circling around the internet, which we pair with some particularly enthusiastic theories from the game's radar team. To satisfy your appetites below, you'll find everything we, need, we know about GTA 6, from how many playable characters it might have to potential locations. Thanks to a flood of information from an alleged GTA 6 project, America's League get reading. Uh, to make all this information with a take all this information with a pinch of salt, make that two pinches actually. Since the game is reportedly very early in development, but the latest alleged GTA 6 leak comes from Reddit. User Jack O'Lantern1982 relayed a grand total of 23 details about Rockstar's upcoming game, as well as confirming that it is in development. They say its code name is Project Americas, as the game will take place over multiple countries, namely Brazil uh, in a fictional Rio and Vice City in the US, which is Miami. Heavily influenced by Netflix's Narcos, which is a phenomenal series about the origins of the cocaine trade, you can find information from Jack Lantern below and clarity along with details uh, fired in. The next GTA title has been in development since 2012. So there you go. But production didn't begin properly till 2015. But Red Dead Redemption 2 obviously took the, the focus of Rockstar. So Rockstar Worldwide, Kodama's Project America, set in both Vice City in a fictional location based on Rio. Some linear missions take place in Liberty City. Think Ludendorff and GTA 5, so South Yankton. So there, there might be some Liberty City uh, side, side play there. Game on balance wheels in an arcade, and it won't be as realistic as Red Dead do. Oh, that's a bit of a shame. One playable protagonist, most likely male, not female, which is a frustration, set in the 70s and 80s. So it's going back in time. So think of Vice City era. Your player's up-and-coming drug lord wannabe named Ricardo. Another key character called Casey is, is a part of the narrative. You start off as a grunt doing runs as a cocaine smuggler from Vice City into the new large South American area before making connections with big-time drug lords and making their way up multiple cities. So we could see more than just Vice City and a fictional Rio. There will also be a giant prison which will play a part in the game. There will, it will feature a chapter system similar to Tarantino flick or Red Dead Redemption 2. That's interesting. Where there is a heavy focus, hurricanes and floods natural disasters. Buildings change over the eras, vehicles too, so older rare classic cars get more expensive as time progresses for economy. Ah, that's interesting. Heavily inspired by Netflix's Narcos, they want an incredible 70s, 80s soundtrack. A young Martin Madrazo, this is something that I want to see as a link to a character that is currently in the universe, will make an appearance as well as his father, who is a big drug lord at the time. We do some missions for the Madrazo family involving kids and other gangs. That's been linked. That's been leaked. Drug Empire building is a mechanic center by city, so I city stories, but bigger. Think the GTA Online system and dial it up to 10. You can only have weapons on your person, no arsenal in your back pocket, like Red Dead Redemption 2. Your personal vehicle will be like your horse saddle in Red Dead Redemption 2, or your equipment stored in the trunk. You can also store your body armor in the car if you wear it, it, happens, it appears no longer just an invisible thing. Oh, okay. There'll be tons of su subtle subtitle reading. Think Max Payne 3 amounts, very immersive, like watching an episode of Narcos. Whether we're in South America, I don't expect to hear much English. Vice City, however, mix, 
place for everything but most English. Last bit of narrative intake or discuss topics such as HIV and the immigration crisis at the time, and a fictional version of Fidel Castro. Mm. Next gen only, not PS4 or Xbox One, uh, so PS5 and the new Xbox. GTA 6 is now their primary focus alongside another title, which might be Bully 2. Uh, eh. Game is still in pre alpha, so names, location details could only could and probably will change. No ETA and release date. Here's the leaks from Fire Den, edited for Clarity 2, so that was the Reddit leak. The game is set in modern day Liberty City, so obviously there's a time from 70s, 80s to the 2020s. The beginning of the game is reminiscent of The Wire. Hmm. Police officers are trying to crack down on gang, drug, drug ring based around a nightclub. There are four main characters, two police and two gang members. The plot then twists and goes to upstate New York where it becomes more crime noir. I think Ozark and Breaking Bad. Yes. It will have twice the amount of dialogue as GTA 5 and a really crazy plot twist. The main storyline splits after a while. The criminal side has a sort of sandbox, build a crime empire thing. Fallout 4 meets The Sims. Not so keen on that. I'd rather just do the playable stuff. While the police side is more of a traditional action game with a little twist of Alan DeWar. Earliest release date is oh, here we go. Earliest release date is the holiday season, so sometime between October and December 2021, but possibly 2022 or 2023. So that is what is Rockstar said about GTA 6 on the record. Rockstar's North former president teased the next series entry back in 2013 in a four-part interview with Developed Magazine, which got rumor on, rumor mill online started. We don't know what GTA 6 will be, but we've got some ideas. Said Benzies. We've got about 45 years worth of ideas we want to do. We'll pick the right ones. It comes from the idea first. Where it's going to be set is the first question. That defines the missions you're doing, different things in LA than in New York or Miami. The map and story get worked up together and the stories are based on how it works out so you can lay the mission in. Of course, Benzies didn't give much away about what form GTA 6 would take and recently left Rockstar North in very acrobatic circumstances. So he's gone. However, it is unlikely that Rockstar will rip up GTA series tied and test the development process where building a world comes first with characters and structures laid on top. GTA 5 was created by a thousand developers based across studios worldwide, so it would be a brave move to change the template. In fact, it's probable the location's already set. We spoke about a software provider at E3 2015 to be discretion to suggest if we're able to get this the way. Uh, uh, Fermi, oh God. Uh, da, 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 da. First of insight, CV, da, 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 procedures. Long story short, if Rockstar announced GTA 6 the day after Red Dead 2 came out, and then based on the historical delays between console GTA announcements and release, it was waiting about 22 months, so August 2020. Of course, Rockstar didn't do that. It didn't do anything. In fact, all we have to go on is the world that GTA 6 was early development as of April last year. That makes it different from any sort of release window, but we may hear at least about the game. End of, end of this year with 2022, most likely. That is, it is, of course, entirely possible Rockstar that might try and minimise the window between announcement and release, but that runs contrary to everything we know about pre-release hype circles and drive pre-orders as physical stores continue to decline. However, a surprise digital release remains more viable. Absurdly bold consideration. Uh, there are a number of wild rumours about where it will actually be released. I haven't actually watched Narcos yet. There are a number of wild rumours which we'll address in due course. But let's start with some historical insights so far. GTA games have been set in the following locations. Liberty City, GTA 3, GTA 4, Lost in the Dam, The Ballad of Gay Tony, Vice City, GTA Vice City, San Andreas, Los Santos, GTA San Andreas, and GTA 5. If history was to repeat, Vice City or Liberty City will are the most likely candidates for a return, but it's possible the game will spawn new locations, which feels likelier in the light of expectations set by GTA Online. Well, one gets smaller. Um, speaking to Rockstar's Leslie Benzies in 2013 via the YouTube GTA show, GTA Oakloak, he stated that the ambition for GTA Online was to grow this one until it's the world. We're just going to add a new, on new things to it, new places all the time. Five years on, it's clear that GTA Online hasn't followed this path, with the recent Doomsday Heist being one of the most significant updates in years, but only adding interior locations, missions and vehicles, not new states or countries. Benzies left Rockstar North officially in 2016, but has been on sabbatical for most of the prior 17 months, which has been his influence less quickly from mid-2014 onwards. However, it is worth considering how much of what Benzies claimed in 2013 remains true. The only limitation is the size of the disc and how much more memory we've got. We could, if we wanted, simulate the entire world, different countries, whatever. Rockstar might revisit Media locations first, he claimed, whether we do that or not, but we've got a bunch of old stuff that we're toying with using Vice City, Liberty City, and Alderney are obvious candidates, but have yet to materialise. Back in 2012, Benzies had linked Vice City to the concept of a GTA world. 
Uh, and that in view of digital trends, of course, at some point we would like to have one big world containing all our cities and let the player fly between them and reuse their favourite areas. And in that context, reimagining Vice City is very interesting. Uh, with the life cycle of both PS4 and Xbox One basically coming to an end, which they have now, it's looking more likely that GTA 6 will be a next gen release. It may well do a bit of GTA 5 and release on PS4 and Xbox One at the same time as new consoles, but all of that should be optimising whatever hardware beats Sony and Microsoft without the bag. GTA 5 and GTA 4 both eventually made their way to PC, so you'd hope that GTA 6 PC port is on the cards. It may not it may not have a simultaneous launch, but that extra bit of polish and development time has paid off so far. Hopefully PC fans are always by a little bit again. Which rumours are most credible so far? Uh, am I still in Blackburn? No, I'm in Wokingham these days. There was a rumour around fantasy that GTA 6 storyline will be more sci-fi than other games in the series were on the game's mechanics around time travel, according to a report by Christian today. Yes, there have been strange sub in GTA games before that non quite as on risk as time travelling. This rumour comes via a report from Christian Day, which doesn't name its source, but suggests that teleportation will be possible within a split second. Specific time periods aren't mentioned, but it might be that you're rewinding time to previous moments in the hero storyline. The story told across time periods may be time travel highly doubtful. GTA has traditionally opted for a more grounded take on supernatural phenomena, at least until the edge of reality GTA Online update. The Doomsday Heist, which features flying cars and orbital lasers, otherwise the series has been more circumspect. GTA San Andreas Jetpack was retrieved the game's version of Era 51, and accessible only very late in the game. GTA, GTA 5 is a slightly dark UFO, Easter eggs are curious, outside the story. Every game in the series is consistent within its time period with realism key to the game storyline. It's worth noting that teleportation already is in GTA 5 a kind of, of a kind, but using a mechanic consistent with the story, the decision to use three playable characters was in part a way to allow players to fast travel across the huge map without resorting to mysticism or wormholes. Rockstar told you to show you. There are fan theories that GTA 6 is going to be a feature map that encompasses all 52 of the North American states. All 52. I mean 50. Rather than one single city. Mm. Uh, you can read more about that, uh, but the URL is probably your biggest indication of how sound is going to be sourced. If the game was set across all 50 states, not 52, interpretation can be handy for your protagonist so you can whiz across state lines rather than zip Uh, Fans of bloggers play GTA 6 made use of similar mechanics that keep us off driving game for the crew, which spanned the whole country by placing PC and so on. Return to London. Reports of a London setting for GTA 6 originated with Rockstar Games, put the next game potentially right on the doorstep of its own studio. Rockstar co founder Dan Houser said the following back in 2013. At the moment, it feels like GTA's DNA is contemporary ish, American ish, English speaking ish, but because that's what it's been, it doesn't necessarily mean. Uh, Tokyo, no. Uh, wow, look at the maps. GTA 3, GTA Vice City, San Andreas, GTA 4. San Andreas was bigger than GTA 4 for map size. Uh, and GTA 5 was huge. Matt from the Manor Days. I know a few Matts from the Manor Days, so. That's going back some. Matt, 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 Matt. Which Matt are we talking about? Matt, 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 Matt. Uh, I'll have to have a think. Matt from the Manor Days. Jesus Christ, we're going back some. I've been to the Manor for a long time. Uh, Ah, right, will we finally get a female star as one of the GTA 6 characters? Logic and growing social political momentum suggests that at least one of the playable characters in GTA 6 will be a woman. In GTA 5, you play as three male protagonists, Trevor, Michael and Franklin, but although they were key female side characters, you never got to play as one. When I asked about this in 2013, Rockstar co-founder and GTA lead writer Dan House told the Garden that the team didn't really think about it at the time. It's, that's not to say we wouldn't, or we couldn't, this character is set is just what became came to us. It wasn't like we've got X, Y, X and Y, so we need Z. We were we weren't trying to do it off a checklist. I don't think we'll ever give you something that's believable. Okay. Could we do with the female lead? Of course, we haven't found the right game for it yet. But it's one of the things that we always think about. It didn't feel natural for this game, but definitely for the right game in the future with the right themes, it could be fantastic. For GTA Five, there was no there was an organic thing that came up. These were the characters that would display the theme. What to think about? Um. Yeah, some interesting stuff there. GTA 6 to GTA 6 to feature multiple protagonists with a twist. Another GTA 6 fan theory. 
suggests we will have multiple protagonists with a twist. Imagine a cops versus robbers scenario where one of your playable characters is a police officer while the other is a criminal, aka your average GTA, GTA hero. Where did this fan theory begin? Mostly from the GTA Reddit boards, but it's also a theory I throw around during the early episode. Uh, Rockstar for a great area of morality with no fear heroes or villains like a with wire. Red Dead Redemption 2 is only one player character of Morgan rather than multiple protagonists of GTA 5. It's the same to GTA 6, not necessarily. Um, uh, we'd love to see a multiple protagonist. I'm not doing VR. Combine the most credible puddle, puzzle pieces in single prediction. GTA 6 will launch on a new hardware generation like PS5. Uh, set across multiple locations with multiple playable characters and at least one female lead. GTA 6 will essentially be a shell of GTA's online rebirth on a new hardware, moving the audience from one platform to another. A story element will be retained on account of the potential acquired loyalty game that acts solid as an online playground, but this may abstract be delivered as a single player online hybrid, much like the story component GTA wants to be some Doom Play Heights. Cannot overstate the success of GTA Online, which has been had its biggest year yet in 2017. In February 2018, uh, GTA 5 is now sold over 90 million copies, but GTA Online is a key revenue driver with earnings data from oh, 1.9 billion. Uh, uh, interesting. So, talking about GTA and whether it, when it's coming, uh, we could see a lot of interesting story arcs. Um, what I enjoyed about GTA was not the online, ironically. I don't know why the online's become so bloody popular. I'm not a fan of it. I, I've i definitely enjoyed the, the the story arcs. I've enjoyed the character development. And if we do get a, a young Madrazo, that would be interesting. Uh, the... Um, The amount of time they, I mean, GTA for me is one of the iconic things of my youth and growing up. And yeah, I, I still enjoy playing GTA 4. I've still got GTA 3 and, and, and Vice City as well, and I still enjoy playing Do I play any of the NHL, EA Sports, or 2K games? No, I haven't played them for a, a good few years now. Um, EA, I haven't played any EA Sports games for about three, four years. Um, very disappointed with um, some of their later titles. Uh, there's only so much you can do with a sports title, to be brutally honest. Um, and I haven't really enjoyed playing a, an EA sports game for for quite a while. Uh, I haven't played an NHL game for about, let's say, four years was the last one I purchased. I think 2017. <sighs> So, I haven't played an NHL EA game for a while. I, I think EA Sports... Oh, when I was younger, when, it, when, when you know, um, PlayStation 1, PS2, early Xbox, and they were developing... It was fine. I think you could still develop the game. But as time has worn on, I've gone off sports games. I find them less enjoyable, less... I, I can't get into them as much. And there's only so much you can do with them, gameplay-wise. But uh, we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. Um, yeah, games with no storyline do nothing for me. So if GTA 6 is predominantly online, it will do nothing for me. Uh, it, you need to have that playable on offline story arc that we had in GTA 5 and GTA 4. Um, the I like games with a storyline and an open world roam component. So I like things like Skyrim. I like things like GTA. I like things like Red Dead Redemption, uh, The Witcher, because you can explore the, the wider, the wider uh, wilderness, so to speak. Um, I like my strategy games as well, but at the same time, oh fucking bloody fag, roll this badly. At the same time, with what's available right now, I'm still more likely to play GTA 4 over current releases. I mean, Cyberpunk 2020, 2077 
has gone down like a sack of potatoes. Um, I, as I say, I'm more likely to uh, play older titles than current releases, which is one of the reasons why I haven't gamed for a while. Uh, there's nothing that's really interesting me right now. Um, absolutely nothing at all interesting me right now. Um, I think with with my focus being on work over the last year um, and having to move up several times, my focus has been elsewhere. And yes, that was a question raised earlier that, oh, as you get older, you, you video game less, more responsibilities. I had responsibilities in my 20s. I was still a working man. I was still doing a factory work and, and things like that. But I, 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 my, I found that over the last year or so, there's the video games industry. Uh, there's certain things I don't like about it. it really is. Uh, have I played? I haven't played FIFA for I think since FIFA 12. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really been interested in FIFA for years. But again, there's only so much you can do with that particular style of game. The best thing they can do is just upgrade the graphics every every year a little bit. Um, for the most part, I think that's run its course as well. Um, yeah, very, yeah. You're limited in what you can do with sports games. Very limited. Um, that, that's my opinion on, on sports games. Very, very limited in what you can do. That's my personal opinion. Um, yeah, some of the graphics are great, some of the stadiums are great, uh, but you're very, very limited in what you can do with a sports game. I haven't played the latest FIFA. I haven't played FIFA for years. I haven't owned a FIFA for years. I went off. I'm slowly getting, falling out of love with, with professional football anyway, or soccer, depending where you are in the world. So in that regard, um, I haven't had any interest. I remember, I remember when I was a kid, Pro Evo and FIFA and... Uh, Ah, uh, Birch with Striker and a few other. There were several football game titles out uh, in the in the nineties and early two thousands that I was interested in, and then I just got bored of playing the same game every year. Um, there's only so much you can do with with the FIFA and the NHL and the NFL franchises. There's only so much you can do. Um, it's a thing. There's only so much you can do with it. Um, it's a thing. It's my personal preference. That's just personal preference. Um, it's interesting this, this this live stream has gone on to video games and, and my views on them. Um, I, the games I'm looking forward to is is Gears of War 6 and, and, and GTA 6. They're, they're the games I'm looking forward to in the next couple of years uh, that are coming out. Other than that, I have no real interest. There's, there's nothing right now that's grabbing my interest and saying, buy me, play me. Um, and it's the cost of them now. Uh, and the online, you have to play online. So I, I, just, I just want to play a storyline. I want to immerse myself in a bit of escapism where I don't have to deal with other people online, you know, co-op mode and all that. I just want to immerse myself in a, in a playable storyline like GTA 4. Um, that's, that's what I enjoy doing when I video game. Uh, is now they're getting so much of this online element which takes away a lot of the fun that I find in immerse myself in a one player, single player and offline, just immerse yourself in the storyline and get lost like L.A. Noir, like Max Payne like the GTAs of old you just get lost in it and you immerse yourself and that's the thing I I, I You know, uh, I did enjoy my, my fair bit of online play on Forza and, and the various Call of Duties that I've owned. But for the most part, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, uh, of the view that I, I prefer single player storyline modes, open world exploring games where the online's there if you want to play it. But I just want to focus on playing that storyline, getting immersed for a day, a week, a month, a year, however long the storyline takes to complete and just immerse myself in it. Um, The online's an added option if you want to take it up. But for me, if I was to play the next GTA, 
I think the online play should be an add-on and an optional extra. I think you need to immerse yourself in the storyline. And if it takes, I mean, GTA 5, I think the storyline, the main storyline arc, sort of 100% completion because that's the thing you can do later on. But when I first started playing it, it took me a week and a half. A week and a half just to do the main base storyline. And then when I completed that main base storyline, I was like, oh, I'm exhausted. That was back in 2013. I then went back and then I did more of the secondary missions and, and filled in the storyline arc. I last played GTA storyline completion in, it took me like two, two, three days. Um, I did it differently each time and I found it less enjoyable. Whereas GTA 4, I find enjoyable every time I play it. Every time I play it. And the two expansion packs. I find them more enjoyable every time I play it. GTA 5, I find it less enjoyable every time I play it. And I'm not a big fan of the online. I don't understand how the online's made so much money. I really don't. I really don't. But don't get me wrong, I have I did enjoy GTA 5. I enjoyed GTA 4. If you were to give me a ranking of video games, you'll find most of them are single player storyline games where you can immerse yourself in that universe and just get lost and play your way through. Um, I did a, I think I did a list video of my favorite video games. Uh, it hasn't changed since I did that list video. There has been no, apart from I think the latest Gears of War, there's, there's nothing I can add to that list to say, well, that bumps that one down. Um, that one bumps up. I mean, there's been some games I've been really disappointed with. Like Fallout 4 and Fallout 76, I was really disappointed with the Fallout series, I think. So many glitches. Um, not as enjoyable. Too many side quests. A confused storyline. Um, and just overly frustrating. And I just gave up on it. And I haven't gone back to the Fallout series. And I don't think I ever will. But no, GTA. I mean, yeah, GTA 5 has, was fun. It was, a, it was a nice bit of fun. Because GTA 4 was a bit darker and a bit more morbid and dark, and it's condensed map and it was gritty. GTA 5 had a lot more fun and humour in it, but some dark bits. But it was more humorous. It was a nice balance. But I felt GTA 4 was a more engrossing storyline. I felt more in touch with the characters you're playing, which is Nico Bellic. Um, I felt more engrossed in the storyline, and I can keep going back and replaying and replaying and replaying it time and time again. I might do the storylines like differently and, and do things like differently, but I will still be very engrossed in that storyline. It was very enjoyable. And the two expansion packs that came with it, the Lost in the Dam and the Balagay Tony, filled in the plot holes of the main storyline and they were fun. Dark but fun. And they link into GTA 5, which is great. I think GTA 5 went a little bit too wacky in some, some instances and they went a little bit off base in some. It was fun. One of my favourite games, not my favourite. Not not by a long shot. Um, Red, Red Dead Redemption 2 was brilliant in the way it brought in the chapters uh, where when you complete a certain story arc, then you, you carry on to the next chapter or you can still go back to that area. Um, that's what I'm looking forward to with GTA 6. They take incorporate a lot of the things from GTA 5 and, and Red Dead and GTA 4 and they blend them all together. They're three most successful games. They blend them all together and you'll probably get the best game. But the main play storyline needs to be separate from the online completely in my view um it needs to be engrossing it needs to be a long storyline it needs to be a very big map but it needs to be a long storyline where you can get engrossed for days or weeks or months at a time in your spare time uh if it's too quick a storyline it's not gonna be enough and if it's too long you're gonna get bored um it's what it is but they've been hinting at gta 6 since GTA 5 was about to release, so they've been hinting at it for a long time. Uh, it's obviously in development now, and when it does come, I think it will be big news and it will be a good seller. Um, we'll just have to see uh, how how it all plays out. If it is going to be set in the 70s and the 80s, predominantly with some bits in modern day um, to fill it in. It will be interesting to see how they slot it into the GTA universe and how they develop characters like Martin Madrazo, for example. If that is rumoured that he's coming back, 
your younger self, you can hear his backstory. It will be interesting to see how that all plays out because it's great linking in the various GTAs into the universe. It really is. And Laszlo has been the consistent throughout. If Laszlo comes back, he must. Um, that would be a great way to, I think, continue with the, the, the storyline arc and um, the, the, the GTA world. Which ironically has been linked into Red Dead as well. So both worlds do have little Easter eggs in there. Um, but it is what it is. But again, uh, you know, what we've seen with Microsoft and Sony and uh, their latest consoles and issues the consoles have faced and with Cyberpunk being the biggest flop um, for a long time when it comes to video games and problems with the latest Halo. Part of that is due to the coronavirus pandemic and development of these games and consoles being delayed and disrupted because you know people have to work from home, people have been furloughed. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. But yeah, there's certain video game franchises that I don't play anymore. Uh, there's certain style types of video game that I don't play anymore um, that I just can't enjoy. Um, but there's only a few uh, video game series that I actually am actively looking forward to playing the next one. And one of them is the like, next Gears of War. Whenever that comes out, we just don't know. And then another one is the next GTA. And you know, I'm in my 30s, and you know, that in itself is interesting. Um, but it is what it is. Um, but there's a lot of things to happen between now and then, and obviously with things economically as they are, it's going to be interesting to see when it is released, or when these games are released, and uh, how much they cost. Uh, because um, cost is a big thing that is also basically putting me off gaming at the moment. It's become very prohibitive and expensive in real terms. Um Back when PlayStation first came out, I you know I was one of the first kids at school to get one. Um, as time went on, my family weren't as well off as some of my schoolmates, and so yeah, I lagged behind. I didn't get a an Xbox 360 until I think four months before uh, the Xbox One was released. Initially, um, I, I I couldn't justify spending the money to, to buy the product. And it is what it is. Um, but, you know, we're in the next gen now. Crossplay is now a thing. Um, there's been some issues with crossplay. And more people are switching to PC. And then they are frustrated with, with both Sony and, and Xbox when it comes to their consoles. <laughs> Excuse me. And there are some PC games that are brilliant that just don't work on console. And there are some PC games that I would love to play, but I don't have a PC powerful enough. And the cost to get a game on PC is, again, prohibitive. So cost is a, is a big thing. Um, but we'll see what happens. Like, you know, uh, I, I look at media consumption, how, how things have changed. Uh, well, I'm 31 now. I can remember being, you know, 17, 18, 19, and Facebook was barely a thing. Uh, I mentioned that earlier in the stream that I think social interaction has gone more online than face to face. Uh, I, I do miss hanging out with my mates down, down the, you know, uh, down the down the park and having a kick about. And I do miss, you know, you know, going bowling with them and, and, and things. And yeah, the, con the coronavirus pandemic's had something to do with that. But you know, meet up down the local ice rink or down the local skate park or whatever. But I'm in my thirties now, so. Things change a little bit, but you can still like, hang out with your mates. Uh, I think, you know, obviously things evolve. We are social creatures after all, but my friendship circles change somewhat. Uh, my mate Sam, my mate Rob, we, we don't really game a lot. Um, we, we, we have fun. Uh, obviously, I have my YouTube channels where you've seen some of my videos of some of our adventures on this channel where you know, we're marking around in Rob's yard and you know, um, you know, having barbecues and campfires and all that. And we still do that. We're all in our thirties. Um, but as you get older, you, you, your social interactions change. Um, 
but it seems like yesterday I was a teenager. And a lot has happened since I was like, you know, uh, at school. Uh, the world has changed. And not necessarily for the better. Not necessarily for the better if things change. Um, so when people go like, oh, um, you know, uh, have I watched Narcos, for example? I've seen snippets. Um, I'm not a massive streaming fan. I don't really watch a lot of TV. Most things I like are, are sports. Um, I'm more of a sports guy. I don't really have Netflix. I don't uh, have Amazon Prime. Um, it, against the cost, I'm going to add a bill on top of what I'm already paying from your rent, my council tax, my insurance on my bike, my finance on my bike, uh, food bills. Um, if this was 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, for the amount of money I'm paying in rent for my flat now, I could have had a flat mate um, and a two-bed flat. And I'm not joking. Uh, I could have definitely shared an apartment with a friend. Um, that's the cost of living. Um, but yeah, things, things, have, things have, you know, massively changed. Uh, I Things are interesting. Um and I'm obviously going to hop back to what's going on with, with the COVID pandemic and, and, and lockdown restrictions and vaccine rollout. I mean, actually, I'm having a look at my letter because that's going to be interesting. I'm going to look at my little letter. So work sent me a letter. So we can focus on... Uh, here we go. Let's have a look. COVID-19 vaccinations. This is my company's policy. Now, I'm not going to name the company that I work for because I've got to be a bit careful with my social media conduct when it comes to work. The government is currently rolling out its, its COVID-19 vaccination programme. This policy sets out our stance on employees being vaccinated and how the vaccination programme impacts our workforce. Vaccinations are free of charge on the NHS. They're being administered according to a priority list at vaccination centres, including some hospitals, sports stadiums, conference centres and GP surgeries. It's fine. We encourage employees who are not going to be the GP to do so as soon as they can. It's an individual's choice whether to be vaccinated. This is not mandated. However, when it, coronavirus vaccination becomes available, we encourage employers to take the opportunity to be vaccinated and to make an informed decision by reading up about vaccinations, paying attention to information the NHS provides on a vaccine, uh, offering a vaccine, and being aware of your misinformation around vaccination. So, anti vaxxers put up by other other sources. Um, basically, you should have two doses. Uh, there's a chance you may still obviously spread it even after being vaccinated. Um, time of work, uh, time of work to attend. Will follow our CSOP on planned leave. More specifically, the arrangements are set out in other medical appointments. Where the possible, it is possible to select a time and date for vaccinations. Appointments should be made outside of normal working hours. So that makes things difficult. Or as near as possible to the beginning or end of the working day. So if I do it at the beginning of the work day, there's no point in going into work. Um, employees should obtain approval from their man line manager in advance of taking time off to attend vaccination appointments and must give as much notice as possible. Line managers may ask employees to provide proof of the appointment, such as an appointment card, email or text message. Return to work following vaccination appointments. Following a vaccination, employees should be able to resume their normal work duties, whether that means return to the workplace or working from home. I have to return to the workplace. Uh, social distancing, wearing of PPE, blah, blah, blah. blah. Side effects. So this is this is the funny bit, right? Side effects. Some people may experience side effects. I love this. When they put this on medical adverts after getting the COVID nineteen vaccine. These are usually mild and may include tenderness, swelling, and/or redness at the injection site. That's pretty normal. Headache. Don't like having them. Muscle ache. Oh, my shoulders buggered anyway. Feeling tired. I work crazy hours. Fever and high temperature. That is not pleasant. A less common side effect is swelling of the glands, which start a few days after the vaccine may last for up to two weeks. So people think they have glandular fever, which is quite contagious and not nice. Uh, this is expected as a sign of the immune system response to the vaccine. If you suffer from ongoing issues, you are advised to contact 111 on the NHS. Fever after the vaccine. Now, oh, this gets brilliant. It's quite common to develop a fever after a vaccination. This normally happens within 48 hours of the vaccination, and you should go away within those 48 hours. You do not need to self isolate and book a test unless you have other symptoms. Or... You've been told by an NHS test to protect that you're a close contact. You live with someone who's tested positive, you live with someone who has symptoms. If the fever starts 48 hours after vaccination or lasts longer than 40 hours, you should self isolate and a COVID test. Should colleagues feel so well they cannot attend work or continue to work from home? Absolutely, should avoid the absent manager in the way. Lovely. Treating colleagues with respect. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Da, 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 da. Right. So, basically, that's my COVID vaccination bullshit. I've got other stuff in here. 
Uh, that's my trade union membership that I've got to sort out this evening. So basically, my company is not vaccinating us. We have to do it ourselves. So that's fun, isn't it? Where are my keys? I've lost my fucking keys. I've lost my keys. I have generally lost... Oh, there we are. I found my keys. So yeah, my company's policy, even though I'm a key worker, is we have to organise it ourselves when vaccines are available for less vulnerable people, which is fine. That, that, but we're pushing to have compulsory vaccinations and have it done at work. But we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. Uh, what else have we got? But no, um, if we want to get off the video game side of things uh, and onto uh, political side of things, uh, talking about vaccinations and stuff and, and lockdowns, look at what's happening in Holland. Um, that is having a big impact on Europe the way the Dutch have reacted to the curfew. We'll see how long the Dutch government enforces the curfew long term, um, but there's definitely resistance to further restrictions. People are getting frustrated with this now. Um, very frustrated with how things have been handled by their government. And it is interesting that the fact that the Dutch have decided to riot, now I want to see if the Dutch riots have continued, because... <sighs> Dutch curfew rights. Dutch curfew rights. Here we go. This is interesting. Um, five days no, six days no. So Dutch curfew rights, and whether they are continuing. The Dutch curfew rights of 2021 are a series of ongoing rights in the Netherlands that instigated as protests against the government's COVID-19 prevention measures and specifically the 9pm to 4.30am curfew that was introduced on the 23rd of January, which was basically this time last week. The police have described the events as the worst riots in the country since the 1980 coronation riots, so the worst riots in 41 years. Dutch like a good riot. Uh, they're still ongoing. A week and a day, so that's something. Um, injuries, uh, 12 injured as of the 27th and 575 or more arrested as of the 27th timeline. 23rd of January. In the in Urk, that is a place, uh, a COVID testing centre was set on fire. So they were already protesting uh, in a small town called Urk, which is on the coast. On the 24th, riots on Sunday, so this time last week, were more intense than the previous day. There were riots in Amsterdam, Eindhoven, The Hague, Tilburg, Venlo, Enschada, Helmand and Roermond. In Eindhoven, the riots had set vehicles on fire and looted multiple stores in and around the city's central station. In Enschenda, protesters attempted to break the windows of the Medish Spectrum 20 hospital. More than 300 people were arrested and 2,100 fines were issued. 25th of January, 150 people were arrested during the night from the 25th to the 26th of January in Amsterdam and Rotterdam. Shops were looted and vandalised. The cities of Dambosch, Zwolle, Amersfoort, Alkmaar, Horn, Gouda, Harlem and Wienendal were experienced troubles, including cars being burned and police attacked with stones. 26th of January, Dambosch, Stittard, Gillen, Stein and Kapel, Amden, Ischel issued a merge decree for the upcoming night. Beek and Echt Schusten will have an emergency decree until the 10th of February, which will allow the police to do stop and frisk without reason. Zavol declared an emergency order in which one is one step below an emergency decree in Dutch law. Dutch police designated Den Bosch, Amlo and Harlem as potential hotspots. The hospital in Rotterdam also advises patients not to come during the evening hours as police designated the nearby Zoodplein as a potential hotspot. The riots that took place on the 26th of January were less heavy than the previous days, despite some small riots in Amsterdam, Rotterdam and Hip. Hill Versham and some disturbances in the Hay, Schneidel and Juliendorp. Yeah, these are real places that I can't pronounce because they're Dutch. The situation these six cities and villages were under control within about an hour. Many cities also saw massive support coming from their locals. Cities such as Maastricht saw its hardcore fan base from its local football club, the Angel Side, gather as a reaction to the threats made by supposed rioters. A couple hundred supporters marched with the city, eventually making their way to the city centre to make a statement We will not tolerate destruction and looting. Most of them went home at around 9 pm to adhere to the curfew rules. 27th of January, there were no major riots, only small disturbances in The Hague and Rotterdam. In Rotterdam, a theatre was set on fire. And on the 28th, a relatively large group of youths who were shooting fireworks in Teal 
there were no more riots and services reported there as never as of the twenty eighth. But there's still heavy police presence and uh it's interesting um that they propose a curfew back in September, the Dutch government. Uh, but they're not going to support the House of Representatives, which is the Dutch Parliament, because of the strong association with the curfew with World War II and the Nazis. Four months later, the measure was deemed necessary as the number of infections was not declining fast enough, despite the fact that the Netherlands had been in a full lockdown since December the 14th. Furthermore, the variant of the virus, which we've had here in the UK, uh, continues to spread across the country, raising concerns for a potential third wave of infections. Um, the Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, who's basically, well, uh, in charge of a government that doesn't really exist because his government basically resigned on on mass the other week due to a benefit scandal, which I've discussed before, announced his plan to reduce a 8.30 to 4.30 curfew at a press conference. On the 21st of January, a majority in the House of Representatives voted to support the proposal for a motion to postpone the curfew to 9pm, so half hour. Had been adopted, the curfew would be effect from the 23rd of January to at least the 10th of February. So there's another 11 days of this. Non-violent protests against the government's COVID protection measures have taken place on several occasions prior to the announcement of the curfew. However, on the 24th, illegal demonstrations against the curfew in Amsterdam and Eindhoven escalated to violent riots in response to police interventions. Calls to riot were subject to spread on social media, leading to riots in other places as well. So there you go, reactions. As the Prime Minister told reporters that the recent events had nothing to do with protests, this is criminal violence and will be treated as such. Minister of Finance, Rupert Huska, Wow, that's a weird name. Uh, the Minister of Finance, basically, said that the riots would not make the government capitulate to a few idiots. Minister of Justice and Security, Ferdinand Grappa House, that's a cool name, uh, said the same. Apparently, small groups might necessary to riot, but this is not because of the corona policy, because you don't have a to leave a shop for that. Grappa House added that the police and the Konikiai uh, Mash, I think that's the military police, we're cracking down the rioters. They'll be subject to summary judgment and can face unconditional prison sentences. Uh, Gert Wilders, uh, who is the far right leader, and Jesse Claver, who is uh, the Greens leader, respectfully accuse each other of inciting the riots. Jesse Claver accused Gert Wilders of inciting to riot, while Gert Wilders demanded that Jesse Claver remove his party's rank and file from the Schildersweig, a neighbourhood where the riots happened. The Mayor of Eindhoven, uh, John Joritz, Joritzma, said that if we continue down this way, we'll head for civil war. Well, that's strong rhetoric. The mayor of Rotterdam, Ahmed Aboutalayev, released, he's the first Muslim mayor in, in Holland, uh, released a video in which he directly addressed the rioters. He asked if they felt proud to destroy their own hometown and promised them police would crack down on them. He went on to applaud the real heroes of the city's history that rebuilt the city of the Rotterdam Blitz instead of destroying it. To the entrepreneurs whose establishments were damaged, he promised to work together with insurance companies to support them. A spokesperson of the Dutch armed forces state that the Royal Netherlands Army had not yet been asked to help curb the riots. However, if the armed forces were asked to help, it would be limited to logistical and material support. There's some pretty strong rhetoric coming out from the politicians uh, in, in Holland due with the riots, but this was a fear that a lot of people had. That the stricter the measures were brought in and the longer they lasted, the more there'll be resistance from civilians. We live in democracies. We've seen anti-mask protests, we've seen protests against the handling of the COVID pandemic, we've, we've seen other social issues take place, um, but the Dutch have decided to go into full-blow riot mode and uh, quite nasty protests. It is interesting that about 18% of the Dutch population don't agree with the government's curfew policy. And it's also interesting that the Dutch government waited four months before actually bringing the policy in. They considered it back in September and decided against it. And the, the Dutch parliament voted it down. So it is interesting to see what's happening in Holland. Um, it seems to have quietened down. But as someone who lives in the UK, and, we, and, and I have very little faith in our government's handling of the situation either. And I've been quite open about that with, with my friends. And you look on the sports channel and that. And, 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 fans in attendance, you know, uh, sports being suspended, all that kind of stuff. I've, I've made it quite clear that there seems to be no universal direction from the politicians, the industries of industry leaders, uh, community leaders. There's no universal direction or policy. It's it's all haphazard and, and all over the place. And it leads to things like this. Because there's no strong direction from government and the rules are very confusing and haphazardly being implemented and the negative stories of the press keep circulating. Um, 
you look at countries like Australia and New Zealand that have dealt with the pandemic a lot better than than others in in Europe, especially. And you and you look how successful they've been in 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 not only national government but regional governments as well, because there's Australia's got states and territories, and they have their own COVID lockdown rules. And they they still have some kind of universal direction from from national government. Uh, the UK there's there's a debate about. The rules in Wales, England, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Uh, there's four parliaments to sort out. There's local elected mayors to sort out. There's there's clearly, especially a, a, a subsection of society, predominantly young, like my age group, who are just flouting the rules because they just don't care. And uh, social media has had a massive part to play in this. There's a lot of false information out there online. A lot of these illegal gatherings and, and protests and, and Holland riots have been, again, instigated by social media. Um, and people are encouraged to, to do the things they've done. And what this reminds me in Holland is very similar to what happened uh, a decade ago in, in London and other cities in the UK with the, 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 the riots in the summer of 2011, a decade ago, where uh, again, a significant proportion of the population got a bit fighty. And there were reasons for that. A lot of it was to do with how the police dealt with minority groups, how the police dealt with, with firearms offences, uh, how the police dealt with deprived areas, uh, funding of deprived areas. Um, and what we're seeing in Holland is, is again, uh, mostly youth, um, mostly from deprived areas. They are angry for a variety of reasons, and um, this curfew was the spark that set off the riots. <sighs> there's, there's clearly a simmering resentment uh, in, in the democ democratised Western world uh, against government policies, social issues within certain locations, um, a polarisation, and a lot of young people are feeling left out, left behind, frustrated, angry, uh, you know, and there's a simmering resentment that's been there for quite some time. Uh, the French have had this as well uh, in deprived areas. And this then comes down to central government policy. And then we can go back pre-COVID and discuss this, like the issues in France, the multiple riots we've had in France over the last few decades that flare up every few years. There's, there's riots, especially in deprived areas of big towns and cities in France, especially in uh, with young people and in immigrant communities that feel sidelined, less economically developed. Um, there, there's clashes there with the police and how the police deal with, with some of these deprived locations with the high crime rates and how the police have dealt with issues. Um, we There is definitely a simmering resentment and it is in a certain subsection of society. And most of these rioters are in my age group. Um, they're being activated by social media. They 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 are frustrated with a variety of things. It just needs one thing to trigger the outpouring of anger. Um, and the fear was by, and it has been stated during the press releases of, of the British government, the Canadian government, the Australian government, uh, advisors have said we may have civil disturbances the longer these, these lockdowns and, and restrictive measures are in place. And I've had this discussion with work colleagues. Um, I've had this discussion with... Um, with my neighbour Adam, uh, who has to work from home, uh, he doesn't mind working from home, but he's a bit frustrated that he doesn't really can't do things, go out, socialise. Uh, me, uh, three of us, uh, my neighbour Jamie upstairs, my neighbour Adam next door, we were planning at some point if, when pubs were open to, to just have a pub meal, go to the pub, woking or something, just go for a, a couple of pints, have a, have a social kind of gathering, and then when we were planning it, they they shut all the pubs down again. So there is a, a lingering frustration, uh, business owners are getting frustrated because they're losing money, they have to put staff off. There's, there's, the way COVID's hit, there was lingering resentment before. There was an undercurrent of frustration, uh, polarisation with people, with politics. And social media has had a massive part to play in that. Um, now, I'm apolitical. I, I now vote for independence. I, I don't vote for a political party anymore. Um, I feel that the mainstream parties across the board here in this country, in the UK, have 
have don't represent me. Uh, they don't represent what I think the people need. Um, and you look at the government and the opposition parties that we have and the members of parliament we have in the UK, it is not as good as what it was when I first was able to vote in 2008. The, the quality of politician we have is, is weaker. Uh, the, the quality of governance we have is not on the same standard of what it was a decade or so ago. Um, I don't know how other people feel around the world. Uh, I know we have an Australian viewer in the, in the chat. I don't know how you feel about your state and national government in Australia. Um, I you know the Australian government took a big hit with their response to the the bushfires this time last year, they were getting hammered by angry residents of the areas affected going, well, where's the help? And then COVID hit, and that made obviously the recovery a lot more difficult. But there, there, there clearly is a resentment. I, mean, I look at America as, as the barometer of democracy, right? What we claim is the barometer of democracy. And look at the, the Trump years. The build up to his election and and the aftermath of Biden's election and, and, and then the period of time where Trump is president. There's a lot of divisiveness in US society. There's been some very nasty riots in the US. Um, and you look at it and you go, wow, like how has thing how have these things escalated so badly? Um, there's clearly a division between the East and West Coast. Uh, Middle America feels ignored uh, and not represented when it comes to policy domestically. The East Coast and the West Coast and the Middle. There's a massive division in the US. There's a division between uh, Republicans and Democrats that's grown. There's a, a massive division in mainstream American society. A lot of people have, have little faith in their politicians. Um, and there's, there's, there's clearly issues afoot that have been allowed over the last, I'm going to say two decades, to, to simmer under the surface that in the last four or five years have really exploded to the surface and um, exposed flaws in the US system quite badly quite badly and quite openly. I And then I, I look here in the UK and we've had the debate about in the UK's membership of Europe, and that's been very divisive. Uh, government policy domestically has been quite divisive. Um, and again, in the last, I'm going to say 12, 14 years, it's been simmering and it's been building and it's burst. So it's interesting. Uh, we're, we're at a crossroads in our society, massive crossroads. Some people have got very, very wealthy out of very difficult economic times for a lot of working class people. Very wealthy. Um, the wealth gap between the working classes and the wealthiest is growing, uh, and has grown massively. Um, economic policy has been questioned. And continues to be questioned the, the industrial policy going forward long term, um, energy policy. But a lot of the a lot of that is new point when it comes to social policies on the ground. So I'll be interested to see how people feel about how they feel. Uh, oh, what's happened to Greece? Greece is an interesting one. So the eurozone crisis that that well uh, basically happened after two thousand eight. In around twenty ten, the eurozone had its massive crisis. Basically, post-2008, Ireland was the first country to have financial problems because a lot of their in, a lot of their economy was based on property ownership. Property prices collapsed because in Ireland, much like most of the Western world, um, there was people were basically given mortgages they shouldn't have had, given loans they couldn't repay. When times were good, people invested in property. So 90, I think 90% of Irish citizens of voting age were property owners. 
90% of adults own their own property in Ireland. Um, property prices now, you've got mansions that were worth millions of euros that are now worth a couple, couple of hundred thousand at most. So the property price has collapsed. So people who invest in property have lost a lot of money. Um, that then spread to other EU Eurozone countries. God is fucking struggling this moment. Greece had a much weaker economic base. Uh, um, the the, the uh, Athens Olympics has actually put a heavy burden on the Greek central government. Greece had a lot of government debt. A lot of government debt. Similar with Italy and Spain and Portugal. Portugal survived all right. Spain, eh, bits of the Spanish economy are, are wrecked. And COVID isn't helping. Greece was heavily reliant on two industries. Two industries in Greece are profitable before COVID. Pharmaceuticals and tourism. Uh, the construction industry um, wrapped with debt. Government contracts unpaid. Um, the uh, 2004 Olympics put a heavy burden on the, the Greek treasury. And uh, they, they were still building uh, the Athens Olympic venues the day of the opening ceremony. They were still doing building work. And most of those venues haven't been used since. So bear that in mind. The Olympic legacy kind of thing. And that's a sports thing, but you link it into politics and economics. 2008 comes along. And uh, Greek banks go bust. Um, the Greek economy uh, heavily relied on a couple of niche. I mean, shipbuilding used to be one of the big things of the Greek economy. Um, ship ownership. Uh, so cargo lines would have a uh, Athens or Piraeus or Thessaloniki as their, their, their main port. So shipping was a big part of the Greek economy for decades, decades. I shifted to tourism and uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, pharmaceuticals and tourism are the only industries, well, pharmaceuticals now are the only, is the only industry that makes any money in Greece. Tourism, COVID, tourist islands is hammered. Um, and this is before the, the, the refugee crisis from Syria really hits in. But the, the Greek economy is heavily reliant on a couple of industries. Um, heavily reliant. Uh, the, the EU Central Bank and the EU itself uh, put upon some hefty, if, if people think in the UK our austerity measures on the, the coalition government of 2010, 2015 were bad, they were pretty benign compared to what happened to Greece and Spain and Italy. Italy have gone through several governments since 2008. Multiple prime ministers, Prodi, Berlusconi, Monti, um, a whole host of, of prime ministers. Spain, um, there's growing unrest in Basque Country and Catalonia, um, and they are key industrial areas in Spain. So Spain's in a little bit of a crisis still politically. The Spain construction industry just shut down overnight, like literally. Uh, they were building these these new towns, and oh, drop me fucking fuck in the ash, Jesus. So the Spanish economy, uh, there was a construction uh, boom. Uh, and Top Gear, you know, uh, when Clarkson, May, and Hammond were still on it, they 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 went to to do a, a one of the special episodes, and they're driving around an airport that's abandoned. They built this airport with no flight flights are going there. Huge sections of this Madrid suburb, they built these buildings and they're unoccupied. Offices, apartment blocks, houses, factories. So what happened? Not just Greece, but a lot of Southern Europe had banked on things still being good and taking the tourist money and the investment from Northern Europe uh, into factories and hotels and a whole host of things. And then the Eurozone crisis hits. Now, the Eurozone crisis is some of the economies um, have signed up to the euro, which is a political currency, not an economic one. It's, it's a flawed currency that will uh, have another financial run at some point. It'll be interesting to see how the economies, especially Greece and, and Spain, which are heavily reliant on tourism, bounce back um, from COVID. Uh, the Greek economy is in tatters, even now. Pensioners aren't getting their pensions. Public sector workers aren't getting paid. Um, unemployment skyrocketing. Greece is in a very bad state. It's become very politically volatile as well. Um, Basically, the Eurozone crisis happened. They were forced to put in some very strict austerity policies that were very unpopular. 
Um, the country lurched from crisis to crisis, and the European Central Bank just printed money. Printed money. Um, the Eurozone crisis has abated somewhat in, in some countries. And then COVID hit. It will be interesting to see what happens in the next 12 to 18 months, especially in places like Greece. Uh, the unemployment rate has skyrocketed. Um, economic output has just dropped off a cliff. Uh, and before COVID, there was only two industries that were viable in Greece that were making any money, and that was pharmaceuticals uh, and um, transportation is another one. So shipping is still vitally important. There's still a lot of registered, a lot of goods come into the EU from outside the EU via uh, Piaris, which is the port of Athens. Uh, so the Greek ports are still uh, importing a lot of stuff. But the port workers, some of whom are state employed, aren't getting paid. A lot of strikes. Um, people's savings are worthless. Um, the Greek government can't set its interest rates. They're set from the European Central Bank, which is a flaw with the euro system. Pensioners can't even afford to heat their homes. And then the refugee crisis hits on top of that. Uh, the Greeks weren't given much support from the rest of the EU and they were overwhelmed. And they've got to pay for that. They, they, Greece has run out of money, basically. Um, it didn't have the most diverse economy to begin with, but it actually starts, the Eurozone crisis starts in Ireland and then spreads to other weak economies across Europe. Now, Ireland's recovered to a certain point, but property prices are still destroyed. If you're a property owner in Ireland, you're, you, you've lost your investment. Unless you bought the property really, really cheap and it's still worth more than what it was pre-crash or when you purchased it. If you bought your property in Ireland in a very cheap location, so um, let's say in West Ireland, uh, if you bought property in Dublin or Cork or one of the big towns and cities, it's, it's now worthless. Property prices are worth nothing. There are mansions going up for sale for like a thousand euros because the owners have lost all their money. Bankrupt. They have to sell their assets. So now's a great time to buy an Irish property. If you haven't got a lot of money, you could buy like a whole bloody street for like about a million euros. You could buy a whole bloody street of properties. The thing is, the property prices in Ireland are bouncing back. Property prices in Ireland, and, and then it spread to other countries that were exposed with weaker economies, um, especially in the banking sector. The Greek banks have gone belly up. Italian banks are struggling. Uh, and these are countries with a lot of high public sector, so government debt. Greece's government debt out of control. The Italian government debt's hideous. Uh, chronic financial mismanagement at government level um, helped also trigger this Eurozone crisis. I mean, Italy and Greece are another Eurozone crisis away from economic collapse. It's a thing. It's a genuine thing. And parts of southern Italy have an unemployment rate of 40%. So it's this is a long-term problem that these economies had countries had before they joined the eurozone um they haven't been addressed for decades um they still have not been addressed and i uh, you might have to have uh, a reinflation with a new currency there are calls for some for the greeks to go back to the drachma and the italians to go back to the lira uh the euro actually only really benefits Germany and Scandinavia as a currency. Uh, the, uh, France has had its own economic woes as well. Um, that's where the OFS movement comes from, uh, with Macron's government you know, trying to change pension rules and retirement age and, 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 and your value of your pensions to reduce um, government debt. Uh, Spain, I mean, it was only 35, 40 years ago, Spain was still a military dictatorship. Greece has had military dictatorships. Italy's had political instability for decades. And with, with political instability and with weaker economic bases in certain regions, or in Greece's case, the entire country, it's a problem. Ireland's issue is it was heavily involved in the property, which means loans, and when banks struggle and you can't repay your loans or you can't get credit, that's when the economy struggles. There wasn't enough diversification of the economy of certain countries. And Greece's economic output is not what it was pre-2008. It's in a terrible state. The only thing keeping Greece buoyant 
before COVID was tourism and pharmaceuticals. Now, pharmaceuticals is the only industry in Greece that's making any money right now because of COVID development, COVID vaccine development and medical, you know, machinery and things like that and medicine production. But not enough people in Greece are trained in the pharmaceutical industry. So that's a problem. There's been a massive drain of uh, skilled labour leaving Greece, uh, other EU countries and, and overseas. So there's a, an issue. There's a, a growing issue with youth unemployment long term. Some people have never had a job. And it's not with lack of trying. There's no jobs available. And yeah, the, Greece is in a very, very bad place. Um, what's happened to Greece is, well, it's, it's there. The country exists, but it's basically bankrupt. And I'm not sure how certain members of the German society feel about bailing out countries that have had poor economic policies. And then that's where the, this is one of the problems that the EU faces uh, is they want all EU member states to eventually sign up to the euro, which is a flawed currency. And um, it means countries can't set their own interest rates and uh, have less say on their economic policy, uh, which is a problem. Um, the political side of the EU is the issue. And unfortunately for Greece especially, uh, it became a political punching bag in Brussels uh, because uh, the government became very unpopular with its austerity policies. Ironically, the Greek people want to keep the euro as a currency, which I find really weird. The Greek economy is not set up the euro on exchange rate and, and inflation and price controls and economic base. This is where the euro as a currency is flawed. Um, I've got friends from Greece. So I, uh, my friend Angelos is from Athens. Um, there's a reason why he's living in the UK. He can earn more money here. He has, you know, earn a better living here, he's made his home here. Um, for the same job he would do in Greece, he will earn twice as much here. That tells you something. The average wage in Greece is not very high. He's got better job prospects here because he's multilingual. Um, he's an intelligent guy. That's the problem Greece has. Those with money and skills are leaving Greece. Uh, similar with Eastern Europe. Uh, which is why a lot of the Eastern European countries haven't signed up for the euro. And the problem is, in 2004, uh, the EU expanded to Eastern Europe, and a lot more countries that were poorer joined the Union. And what these poorer nations have also found is there's been a massive drain in uh, talented, skilled labour that has gone westwards and northwards. Uh, so uh, where I'm working now, we have Romanians and Poles, um, working for us. Uh, we, where I worked before, we had um, Romanians and, and, and Polish uh, drivers and, and uh, working at my depot. Some of them have been here for years, though, so. Uh, and they were good at their job, but they had obviously come here because they could earn more money. Um, so, domestically, Poland and, and Romania and, uh, and uh, some of the other Eastern European countries, there's been a massive, what they call a brain drain and uh, this is an issue that a lot of the countries are facing is their best and brightest will get their university degree or they've learned their skills and if they take their skills out of the country and they go elsewhere uh, and they can earn more money elsewhere and uh, they end up staying overseas and don't come back <sighs> that's the problem that poorer European nations are facing and because you have that brain drain you lose that economic base going skilled labour then it means you know, there isn't an economic base to continue now bearing in mind in the tourist areas of Spain and Greece and, and other parts of Europe a lot of northern Europeans have gone there to set up business as well so you, you have that Brits and Germans and Scandinavians have gone to Greece and Spain and set up bars and restaurants and uh, other industry, other businesses linked to the tourist industries, such as boat hires, and car hire places, um, excursion, and all these various tour companies have brought their, you know, um, uh, skilled labour in. Um, but again, the wages aren't great. Uh, 
those workers, a lot of them don't stay long term. They go back home after a season, casual labour. So the EU does have some issues. Um, Greece itself, its economic base is weak. Uh, it should never have signed up to the euro, but that was the EU's policy for Brussels, was new members have to adopt the euro, and Greece adopted it far too quickly. Um, Northern Italy can sustain the euro. It works in Northern Italy, but in, in Southern Italy it doesn't work. The economic base isn't there regionally. Uh, Southern Italy and Sicily is really poor in comparison to Northern Europe. I've been there, I've seen it. I've seen the 40% unemployment. I've seen the queues outside the doll office. I've seen the, the slums. I've seen, uh, you know, um, frustrated you know, youth. I've seen it. Um, and we're now having that replicated in, in large towns and cities across Europe where there's a portion of underemployed, predominantly men, late teenage years to early 30s who've struggled to find consistent work. And when they do find work, it's low paid. And um, yeah, the, the, even in the wealthy affluent areas that I've worked in, there is a, an issue with youth underemployment and unemployment. Um, doesn't matter if you're in a wealthy location where the average salary is high, or if you're in a, a larger urban area where the average salary is lower, there is still issues with underemployment. Uh, and it is in the younger age groups. They have been most hard hit by the COVID pandemic job-wise, and they've been hit by the economic downturn following the 2008 crash. And Greece is a prime example of that. Uh, I think youth unemployment is at like 40 to 50% uh, in, in some parts of Greece. Uh, there's not a lot of work available in the big towns and cities that are tourist based. So the industrial heartlands of Greece, they're, they're unemployed. Um, and because of an economic downturn, there's less goods coming through the ports, there's there's, there's you know um, less work available on the docks, there's less work available in the factories, there's less work available uh, just generally in, in retail. And it has an impact long term when you, when you, you know, down the road in 20 years' time, there's going to be a, a generation. They all have kids. Their kids will have kids. And there'll be a lack of employment in certain... We've seen this in deprived areas in the UK. We've seen it in the US. We've seen it in South America that slums develop because of an economic downturn. It takes a long time for those economic deprived areas to get back on their feet. Um so well, what's happened to Greece after the Great Depression? It's still continuing. Um, I mean, uh, I'll just have a look at Greek economic output. It's interesting because it's an interesting question. I wasn't expecting to have like, you know, uh, let's have a look at Greek economy. Let's have a look. Uh, apparently the Greek economy is the 51st largest in the world. Uh, and in terms of, in terms of in, in terms of purchasing power, it's the 53rd. So the economy of Greece um, is this is the 51st largest in the world with a GDP of 209.853 billion. It's not making a lot of money. Uh, Greece is the 53rd largest economy for purchasing power with 336.486 billion. Uh, it's the 16th largest economy in the EU, so it's dropped down the list of economies in the European Union. And the average salary is about nineteen and a half thousand dollars. It's not great. Uh, population has gone down. The GDP has gone down. Uh, GDP growth. Okay. So, GDP growth last year dropped by eleven point seven percent. They're in recession right now. Uh, average salaries have gone down as of what was last recorded in twenty nineteen. Uh, agriculture. So the big uh, portions of their economy. Agriculture makes up only 4.1%. So agriculture doesn't make a lot of their economy anymore. It used to make a lot of money. Industry, 16.9%. And services, which includes tourism, at 79.1%. That was in 2017. Inflation. They're in negative inflation. They're in deflation right now of minus 2.3%, which long term is not good for an economy, uh, which is bad. Uh, in uh, Overall terms, inflation was below 1% in 2018 and 2019, and overall is at 
6% negative overall in the whole of 2020 estimated. Right, population below poverty line. Now, this is the massive scary statistic. As of 2019, so pre-COVID, it was at 30% were living on or below the poverty line in, in, or social exclusion. It's got a very high human development index, which is good. Um, so labor force is, uh, there's a 61.2% employment rate, so 39% uh, unemployment. Ouch. Nearly 40% unemployment. That's scary. 12%, 12.5% are employed in agriculture, 15% in industry, and 72.4% in services, which includes tourism. That's a 2015 estimate, and that's during the height of the, the crisis. Okay, unemployment. So bearing in mind, you've got pensioners in there, 16.7% as of October um, last year, total youth unemployment. As of May last year, so this is early on in the, in the COVID pandemic, 37.5% of youth unemployment. That includes uh, 15 to 24-year-olds. So that's where you have the long-term unemployment issues. Average salary in 2018 was going up and uh, average net salary after tax was going up. Median net salary was going up. This was all based on 2018 and 2019 numbers. So if you look at 2020, gone. Main industries, shipping and shipbuilding is fourth overall. Tourism, food and tobacco processing, textiles, chemicals, metal products, mining, petroleum. Uh, exports account for 33.86 billion. Uh, they've got exports, goods and everything like that. Main export partners, Italy, Germany, Turkey, Cyprus, Bulgaria and Lebanon. That's from 2017. Imports are actually worth more than exports. So they actually spend more on importing goods than exporting them. So there's a trade deficit there, which is a problem. Uh, uh, yes, I, when the manor reopens, I would happily go to the pub. Um, we'll have to see what happens, um, obviously. But yeah, I'm more than happy to go to the pub um, when things reopen. Just get hold of me on Facebook. Uh, just drop us a message on Facebook and we'll sort something out. <laughs> Uh, major import partners for Greece. So let's go back to Greece. Major import partners. Germany makes up 10% of imports. Italy, just over 8%. Russia, nearly 7%. Iraq makes up a fair bit. South Korea, China, Netherlands, and France, as of 2017. Wow. Um, what a lot of debt there. Gross debt, 436 billion as of 2016. That's gone up. Um, public debt, oh Christ. 337.5 billion in government debt. That is scary. That's gone up. Uh, budget balance, uh, revenues gone down, expenses. Mm. Oh dear, their credit rating is is uh, not great. Uh, foreign currency reserves, they have 7.8 billion in foreign currency reserves. Um, wow. Their product productivity is the lowest in the EU, OECD, as of 2015. It's not good. Um, uh, tax, largest labour currency. Currency. Obviously, the drachma was the currency until 2002. Um, after the Marshall Treaty in, in 92, uh, they signed, obviously, that was signed later on by Greece when they joined in 95. They uh, applied to join the Eurozone, which they did. Uh, Greece joined the Eurozone in 2001 during the first with the adoption of the euro at a fixed exchange rate uh, with, the, with the old Deutschmark. Uh, on the 1st January, it became a physical currency. And then you could you could trade in your drachma for the euro until 2012, actually. If you had drachma notes, you could trade them in and get euros until 2012. That's weird. Uh, before the adoption of the euro, this is really interesting. It's something I didn't know. Prior to the adoption of the euro, 64% of Greek citizens viewed the new currency with a thumbs up, so more than two thirds. But in February 2005, that figure had fallen to 26%, and it fell further to 20% in 2005, uh, in June. Since 2010, the figure has risen again, and a survey on September 2011 showed that 63% of Greek citizens viewed the euro positively. So at times, the citizens weren't happy with it. I did say that Greeks currently are in favour of keeping the euro, which I find ridiculous. Unemployment rate. Uh, right, okay. Um, talking about the Greek issues, the IMF, who got their forecasts wrong on so many things, said that Greece's unemployment rate would hit the highest of 14.8% in 2012 and decrease 
to 14.1% in 2014. So this is going back a few years during the height of the euro crisis. In fact, the Greek economy suffered a prolonged high employment. The unemployment figure was between 9 and 11% in 2009, which is pre-financial meltdown. It soared to 28% in 2013. Uh, in 2018, since two and a half years ago, it was 20, well, three years ago, it was 20.1%. Um, yeah, and then poverty rate. Uh, as a result of the recession sparked by the public debt crisis, poverty has increased. The rate of people at risk of poverty or social exclusion was 30% just over a year ago in 2019. Those living in extreme poverty rose to 15% in 2015, up from 89 in 2011. Um, and in 2009, extreme poverty was only at 2.2%. So in the last 12 years, Greece has just gone down the toilet. The rate among children between under the age of 17 is 17.6%, and young people, so 18 to 29, to so the 18 to 30 club, is at 24.4%. Unemployment on the rise, uh, Jesus. Those out of work lose their health insurance after two years. That is a shit policy. Further exacerbating the poverty rate, younger unemployed people tend to rely on the older generations of their families for financial support. However, long-term unemployment has depleted pension funds due to fewer workers making social security contributions, resulting in higher, higher poverty rates if intergenerational households relied on reduced pensions received by their retired members. Over the course of the economic crisis, Greeks have endured significant job losses and wage cuts, as well as deep cuts to workers' compensation and welfare benefits. This is where the austerity policies that the EU pushed upon uh, the, the Greeks really are hitting. Um, between 2008 and 2013, Greeks were 40% poorer on average. And in 2014, uh, their disposable household income dropped below 2003 levels. That's not good. So Greece is in a, a mess. So, yeah, what's happened to Greece after the Great Depression? It's continuing. Uh, COVID will not help with that. The problem is, because you have less people earning an income, pension funds are gone. Um, Poverty is on the rise. Unemployment still in the 20 odd percent. It's ridiculous. And youth unemployment in the 1830 bracket is, um, I dread to look at it, basically. It's nearly 40%. Um, that is a massive, massive problem. Um, so when you talk about how, what's happened to Greece after its Great Depression, it's in one. Uh, Long term outlook isn't good unless something is a massive economic rec recovery post-COVID, and people go, oh, we're going on holiday, and we all suddenly charge to Greece on holiday. The Greeks are in trouble. Um, they're heavily reliant on, on Germany. Uh, they've got a, a trade deficit where they're importing more than they're exporting, which is a problem. Long-term unemployment. Um, issues with people you know, in the household, two or three generations in a household, maybe only one of those generations is employed, pensioners, uh, you know, Welfare cuts, budget cuts, pension cuts, salaries dropping, disposable income dropping below 2,000 and level, levels at 2003. It's, that's 18 years ago. That is ridiculous. Greece is in serious, serious trouble. Um, and with the tourism industry basically mummified at the moment because of COVID, that is a massive problem. And when you've got a country that's got a massive trade deficit of about 20%. It's not good. Um, that is a massive, massive problem. And when you have a, a lack of skilled labour because of companies reducing workforces, young people going through the education system can't get a job, um, that is a problem long term as well. Um, massive issues in Greece. Massive. Um, replicated in, in other parts around the world, but Greece is in real, real difficulty. And this can lead to further problems down the line socially, uh, social exclusion, poverty. It, there, there is massive problems in Greece. Um, and they're not going away. So I'd be interested to see what happens with Greece, you know, post-COVID and, and uh, when international travel opens up again and, and the tourists return. And how much disposable income the tourists have, because what we're seeing right across the board is, is job cuts, um, disposable income falling. This could take a generation to fix. It really could. And that means the EU budget spending a lot of money pumping into Greece to keep it afloat. Um, 
The cost of its imports outweigh its exports by 200 billion. Massive trade deficit. Uh, it's it's in trouble. I never thought I'll get a question on, on Greece with its, its, its crisis, but it, it, it's been an ongoing thing for over a decade. Uh, you, you look at the figures, and pre-2009, things were okay. Things were okay. Um, problem is, the exposure of the banking system, the weak economic base, and signing up to a currency which you should not have signed up to. And in the early years of the currency changeover, only a quarter of Greeks supported the euro. So there was a lack of trust in that currency, hence why the drachma was also still big. People were still using drachma or drachmi uh, until 2012. But the buyback um, is a problem. What I find out really interesting is the Greek population now have gone back in favour of the euro, even though it's brought them nothing but economic hardship for a decade. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with Greece and it will be interesting to see what happens with the Euro because other countries that have obviously now joined the EU uh, in more recent years have also signed up to the Maastricht Treaty, which means at some point they will have to implement the Euro. Some countries, like ourselves, kept kicking that problem down the road. Now, we've obviously pulled out of the EU, so now, therefore, the Euro is not an issue. But a couple of the Scandinavian countries, I think Denmark doesn't have the Euro. Um, some of the Eastern European countries don't have the euro. Poland still has the Schlotty, for example. And um, these countries, while well, they've signed up these treaty obligations, are just kicking the problem down the road because they're looking at what happened to Greece, um, especially. Ireland sort of recovered some economic stability, but the property markets devastated and may never recover to the same level it was pre crisis. But they're looking at it and they're going, do we really want a currency that would lead to massive, massive issues? Um, massive problems. I think this is what happened with Brexit. Is the, the British voter and the British businesses that were linked to Greece were looking at the chaos going, Christ, okay, that's a problem. Um, and because Greece is 70 or percent of its industry is, is linked to services, so banking and tourism and, and um, things like that, the tertiary sector is hammered. Uh, the, the only way Greece can get out of this is if there's a positive bounce back post COVID and a tourist return, which will then pump money into the economy and give jobs to the locals. At the same time, they need to fix their manufacturing base. They need to increase exports over imports. If they're too reliant on imports, that is a problem. That trade deficit is killing them. Um, and, and the fact that you've got a whole generation around 40% of the 1830 group out of work. That's, that's a huge proportion of your, you know, employable manpower, or the worker base. 40% of a whole generation of people out of work. Pensions, not great. If you're out of work for more than two years, you lose your health insurance. You know, it's harder for health care. Um, and these issues aren't going away. They're, they're, they're still there, they're not being dealt with. And then COVID comes along, which has led to further strains on an already weakened economy. Productivity is the lowest out of the EU. Um, it's fallen down the rank of, of ranked economies. It's, it's in trouble. Greece is in massive, massive trouble. And unfortunately, EU policy was, let's pose and post austerity measures. And that led to a lot of unrest and anger towards the EU, but then the, the Greek citizens wanted to keep the euro, which I find absolutely bizarre, because the only other option is they bring back the drachma or another currency. And other EU states don't want that to happen, because they've now invested in, in Greece by pumping in emergency loans and, and uh, emergency grants. But I can't see long term how Greece can survive as an economy without a complete economic collapse. And this is one of the things that could happen out of COVID is, is some economies could just be devastated. But Greece was having problems long before COVID. Massive public sector debt, massive. Um, uh, a financial flight with those who had money left, those who had the skills. If they've got skills, they leave. Not been able to get a job once you've finished your secondary or tertiary education um, 
it doesn't matter if you're going to university or not, you can't get a job. And you're on benefits, you're not paying tax, there's less social security com contributions going into the Greek coffers, they're making this money out of tax revenue, budget cuts across the board, uh, police officers are going unpaid, um, state employees are going unpaid. It's a problem. So long term, Greece is in trouble. Uh, the Greek economic crisis, while we've got through the worst of the Eurozone crisis for now, they haven't recovered as well as some of the other countries like Ireland, which has sort of bounced back to a point until COVID hit, where there was a brief period of, of recession. Greece is still in one. Um, <clears throat> and it'll be interesting to see post 2021 long term what happens with Greece, because there's massive issues there. Which could take a generation to fix, and that's the problem. It, 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 you look at its exports to imports, and uh, it's more reliant on importing goods than exporting them. That is a problem, a uh, massive problem. Not good. Not good. Uh, so, I don't know what the EU does. I don't know what the Greek government does but they have massive social problems brewing which could take a generation to fix generation and in my lifetime that may, may, ne may never be fixed because their economic base has been completely trashed and they and while there's a, a fair bit of support for the euro currency that's part of the problem that they have They should never have signed up to it. And this is part of the problem the EU faces long term is they've got countries signed up for currency that they shouldn't be signed up to. So long term, there are parts of the EU that are going to end up like Greece. Unless the EU becomes more flexible and has some really deep discussions with itself uh, in Brussels. Because Greece was becoming a failed state. Another problem is massive problems with tax evasion and corruption, but Greece does risk becoming a massive failed state. And I don't know. But reading through that was some pretty grim reading. Um, it's not a not a positive outlook if you're in Greece. Same in southern Italy and, and parts of Spain. It's they haven't fully recovered. Um, they've taken an absolute battering, um, but they've got bigger economic bases that can sort of cover that. But Greece that doesn't have the economic base and is in serious, serious trouble. It may take a generation or more to get out of it. And that's the problem. I, I've been kind of lucky um, to have a job. Uh, I feel my, I count myself very, very lucky. Um, I wish my pay was more, absolutely. I wish I was getting paid more, but I'm, I'm feeling very lucky about my uh, current employment and my current situation. But I am feeling for a lot of, a lot of people um, from, from uh, you know, in Greece and in southern Italy and in Spain um, and even in, in places like France and, and Ireland, I do feel a lot of sympathy for people. I really do. Uh, but the Greek situation has been a long term thing well before COVID hit. Um, and I, I got, you know, you know, uh, I've, I've seen this, and this is, I think, where there's a lot of mistrust of the EU and a growing scepticism of the EU project is you look at the headlines coming out of Greece and you look at how the EU dealt with it back in you know, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. Uh, and the ongoing situation. If you're a Greek and you've got any skills you want, and you can so say you, you know, you've learned German or, or Italian or English, you want to move to a country where you've got a better economic opportunities, most likely Germany or, or, or Northern Europe, uh, you want to get out of Greece, and that's a problem. You've got this brain drain, you've got this skills gap. And, you know, there's, there's people who haven't ever had a job. There are people my age who 
finished education and couldn't get a job because of the economic downturn following the financial crash and then the ongoing Eurozone crisis that was linked to the US financial crash in Wall Street in 2008. Um, it had a massive effect around the world. The only country that really avoided economic catastrophe the entire time was Australia until COVID. Australia's got a great economic base. Hence why Australia can recover quite well from COVID. Other countries were far more exposed to the economic mess that happened on Wall Street. And what we're seeing with GameStop and all these people and the hedge funds battling the amateurs is we could see another financial meltdown on Wall Street at a time when we're already having an economic crisis due to a pandemic. It seems that people have learned no lessons from the previous foul-ups. It, it was repeating the same cycle over and over again that we had, you know, post-World War One, post-World War Two, in the 1920s. The guy who needs these cyclical, really bad, bad phases, and it's a problem. So we'll, we'll have to see what, what, what happens uh, with, with Greece and other countries. And the EU having issues with its vaccine rollout is a problem as well. Um, and I kind of feel lucky that I'm living in the UK in that sense. Um, but the EU is having a lot of struggles getting its vaccine sorted out. There's discussions between the UK government and Brussels over the AstraZeneca vaccine. Because the EU made a terrible mistake when it, it said its primary production centres would be in the UK, not in, in Europe. Uh, they'll be secondary, and the secondary ones cannot meet the demand of the EU. Um, so that's, that's interesting how this, this live stream has gone from video gaming um, to, to the Greek economic, e economy. But it has wider impacts. Uh, what happens on Wall Street, or what happens with the ERM, back in 92, Black Wednesday, when the UK basically pulled out of the European exchange rate mechanism, uh, has implications long term. Uh, ironically, pulling out of the ERM actually benefited the UK economy massively, ironically, uh, at the time. But we pulled out for the wrong reasons, which cost the government its its power. Uh, that's why the Conservatives lost the 97 election, was its handling of Black Wednesday, which happened just after the the landslide election uh, for Major's government in 92. Not long after, there was this financial meltdown on the stock exchanges, and that had a massive implication for the UK going forward. Ironically, a positive one. But we ended up with the euro being a thing. And there's a reason why the UK never signed up to the euro and kept the pound. There is a reason for that. It's called the ERM, uh, the exchange rate mechanism because they were planning for the euro back at Maastricht, and uh, now we've seen the aftermath of the euro on some economies. But going over to the US, um, what Biden's got to do, and we'll link back to the US and Biden, uh, new president, uh, during the election campaign, he didn't have a lot of domestic and overseas policies, which was really ironic, but he won because he didn't have any. He was the opposite of Trump. People would obviously saw that having four more years of Republican Trump was not what they wanted. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with the US. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the stock market regulators. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with hedge funds long term because the GameStop and other stocks and shares that uh, these amateurs are buying into playing the hedge fund managers at their own game. It's a dangerous game to play. There are unintended consequences. Yes, I can understand average Joe's wanting to play on the stock market and make a little bit of extra money out of whatever income they have. It's fine. The fact they're choosing failing companies to do it is is really interesting because our pensions are tied up with that. Uh, our company pensions are tied up with that. Um, and that is a problem. Um, you know, uh, these companies could go bust. If there's a run on the stock market at this time, would be catastrophic. At the same time, these trading platforms that have allowed people like you and me to want to have a little practice on the stock market, have a little go on the stock market, are also manipulating the market because they're banning certain stocks and shares from being traded. But they're encouraging us to, to trust these, these trading platforms to get on the stock market, but now they're saying, oh, no, you can't. 
So the regulators are getting involved, um, which is interesting. And what happens in the US does actually affect us. Um, we've seen it uh, in 1929, definitely in 2008, although the signs were there before the, the US stock markets went into meltdown that, that fateful day. Um, we, we've seen the aftermath of that over the last 12 and a half years. My entire working life, if I was 20 years older, I would have done all right out of it. Um, <clears throat> because I would have had a career sorted out, had a pension plan, probably owned my own property, uh, and been in a decent position. So, my parents' generation. Unfortunately, I was, what, 17 the day Northern Rock collapsed. I remember that because the Rugby World Cup in France were taking place. And I remember it clearly because it was my first day at work at my local supermarket, Tesco's. So ever since Northern Rock collapsed, I basically, my economic future is, I'm basically not as well off as, as my previous generation, those who were 10, 12 years older than me. Um, my average salary is lower in the real terms is, is people go, oh, well, you work in sanitation, bin man, refuse worker. Yeah. They go, oh, you must earn a lot of money. And I go, what, what planet have you been living on for the last 12 years? I was 12 years older, 20 years older, and I got into the industry. Yeah, I've, I've made some money. I've got a good pension scheme. and I would do all right. Um, and, and there's a, quite a few of my colleagues who actually own their own homes because they've been in the industry for 20, 30 years. I'll never be able. To, I'll, I'll never be able to own my own home. That's the view. I, that's the what I see. Uh, I, I will always be stuck renting a property. Uh, there's a shortage of social housing, um, and that's partly to do what happened in the US. It's one of the reasons why the channel started. Like the original channel, the main channel started, was I was pretty pissed off with life, um, and job opportunities. While they were still there, it was harder and harder to to keep down a job long term because employers preferred flexible contracts and um, the labour market was not as great as what it was a decade before. So I, I understand what it's like and it is frustrating being in that 1830, I mean I'm now sort of on the edge of the 1830 group. What I call the 1830 club actually is 16 to 34 but my generation is less well off than our parents and god knows what our kids generation is going to find in the workplace and, and living standards and uh, wax, average salaries and average house prices but what happened in greece has been replicated in different circumstances around the developed world um there is clearly an issue with youth unemployment some areas are some countries and some regions in some countries are more hit than others but when you've got a 40% unemployment rate in, let's say, a city of people aged between 16 and 32, 34, when you have that kind of employment gap and skills gap, that leads to long-term social problems. Slums will develop. Uh, poverty is a thing. And um, in the decades, two, three decades before poverty was falling, wages were going up. Um, you know, Things were okay for people. But it's what it is, you know, um, what's happened in Greece could be replicated across the EU, could be replicated across the developed uh, Western world uh, on a bigger scale. If America does not bounce back properly from COVID, we could see similar scenes in the US. Biden gets his domestic economic policy wrong um, in the next four years, huge parts of the US could end up looking like Greece. Um, that's a worst case scenario, by the way. But there are certain cities and certain areas in the US that already have high unemployment problems, social deprivation, and replicate here in the UK. Um, it's a thing in the UK. There are issues with high unemployment in certain towns and cities where certain areas of that city have a 
a high unemployment rate, a high crime rate. Uh, youth unemployment linked to high crime. So when politicians are going, we need to get to the cause, the root cause of crime and uh, poverty. We have to look at, okay, what's happening in this particular city, this particular region. A part of it is economic policy. A huge part of it is economic policy. Um, low wages, lack of economic opportunity. Um, it has an impact. I know some people who've, who've struggled to get a job for a decade getting off the benefit system. Uh, struggle to find employment. Always down the, the job centre office signing on to get their benefit payments. I haven't had to use the benefits office since 2012. So I've been lucky in that respect. Um, but there were periods in time where I had lengthy spells out of work and out of education. And it's a long term thing. And it is more prevalent in, in poorer communities and it's more prevalent um, in immigrant communities as well. Um, so there's, there's long term social issues that are at play here. And this COVID pandemic is exacerbating those existing issues. So it will be interesting to see what happens with the economy in the next 12 to 18 months. It really will, because we cannot continue down this path. COVID, the pandemic has exposed flaws in the system that we have in place and economic policy and social policy that we have in place domestically in every country around the world. And they've been exposed and massively exposed. So, yeah, I'll be interested to see what other questions people people have um, before I wound this up. But, yeah, the, the Greek question is definitely uh, an interesting question. Um, and it links into, you know, it does link, it does link into, you know, uh, why I play less video games. It's, it's the cost. If it was more affordable and more accessible, I would do it. Um, I was still playing on the Xbox uh, when I had my last job. I would get in from work and uh, relax and go on the old, uh, the, old, uh, the old Xbox. The last six months, um, I've sort of cheaped out uh, to a certain extent. And, yeah. I think there's more pressing concerns right now. More pressing concerns. Uh, I'm trying to use social media less than what I was before. I'm trying to... And it's difficult living by yourself when there's no social activities to partake in where, like, cinemas are shut, bowling alleys are shut, sports stadiums and arenas are shut, um, places where you would socially interact with your friends are, are closed. Uh, there's a lockdown in place. It is having a massive impact mentally on people as well. Um, so there are things going on that you know are affecting outlook on life. Um, a couple of years ago when I started up both channels, uh, I didn't think we'd be in this position. Uh, there was a lot of hope. And I'm still hopeful long term for the future, but there's a lot of unknowns. And we got to get to this vaccination program the UK government and the global government are rolling out and uh, you know we've got to get through a very tough period it could be a tough period for a long time a long time um, we'll just have to see long term I think some a lot of companies will go under a lot of companies will merge together to survive and independent retailers may completely disappear Independent companies, small independents, self-employed, outside of the trades, for builders and all that, especially retail is, is on its knees. And again, we could argue that big online retailers such as Amazon don't pay enough tax. Um, and then we could have a look at that. Uh, infrastructure projects. There are some interesting interesting thing but anyway, i'm gonna leave that there because obviously there's no more new questions uh it's been what, three hours quite a long one today i appreciate the questions that popped up um obviously gonna be putting some more videos on this channel we'll be discussing some more things that are happening uh, we'll look at the dutch riots whether they continue long term or they seem to have calmed down a bit the last couple of days but they're still ongoing there's still disturbances in holland we will look at the vaccine rollout we'll look at some of the main news stories that are going on and then we'll obviously focus on the sports channel as well thank you very much for watching place obviously 
keep your eyes open for videos on both channels. And I shall see you all very, very soon.